Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good morning, uh, Professor Dore from uh, John Hopkins. And uh, good afternoon, our friends from Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, and Palestine. Please allow me to introduce myself first. I'm Muhammad, the president of Jordan and Arab Societies of Nephrology and Renal Transplantation and the Vice President of the Middle East Society of Organ Transplantation. I'm very glad to co-chair this session with a close friend of mine, Dr. Ayham Haddad. Ayham is a senior consultant nephrologist. Currently, he's the director of Prince Hussein Center for Organ Transplantation in the Royal Jordanian Medical Services. It gives me great pleasure and honor to welcome you all to this highly scientific event. This is the first Levant Interactive Kidney Transplantation webinar, and I'm quite sure and confident that it will not be the last. And uh, I'm, I'm happy that uh, it, it was, this event was approved by the Jordanian Medical Council uh, for uh, four and a half credit hours. I would like to thank um, our partners and close friends in Novartis for sponsoring and supporting this activity. Without them, it could not happen. So many thanks to our uh, Novartis team here in Jordan, Jamal, Sousan, Samah, and Hammam, and the rest of the group. And thank you all for being here and joining us. Special thanks to our friends from the States who are well known to all of us and they have major contributions in the field of kidney transplantation worldwide. Before I start, I would like to draw your attention that we will take comments and questions after each talk and not at the end of the session as scheduled. Our first speaker is Professor Dore from John Hopkins. Professor uh, Dore is a professor of transplant surgery. He's interested in minimally invasive live donor surgery and incompatible organ transplantation. Um, professor Dore is a, an associate vice chair for research, director of epidemiology research group in organ transplantation. He authored more than 250 research articles in major journals. His first talk will be about strategies to promote transplantation in highly sensitized patients. Professor Dore, we're uh, happy to hear you and listen to you. Thank you for your kind introduction. And it's uh, truly an honor to be a part of this first uh, webinar connecting transplantation in so many places. Um, I was asked to just remind everyone of the goals, the educational goals of this program. And I think you can see my mouse. This is the learning objectives for the program as you see on the uh, schedule. Um, I was first asked to talk about uh, strategies to promote transplantation in highly sensitized patients. Um, and I'm gonna focus on the incompatible pair. And what I mean by the incompatible pair is the recipient, the recipient candidate who is sensitized, has a healthy, willing, but incompatible living donor. And what are the options that are available to uh, for transplantation for this pair. So this is assuming that somebody has a live donor that they're incompatible with, because this is really where um, most of the uh, work and opportunities in transplant lie. Um, I show you this picture of the volcano in Hawaii to remind us that crossing incompatible antibody barriers is dangerous business 
Um, there are two major options for the incompatible pair. Uh, one is desensitization, and the other one is to avoid the incompatibilities with kidney exchange, and I'll talk about both of those um, in the next half an hour. So um, this is an example of a desensitization protocol. Uh, there are various protocols that are used across the world, um, and many will depend on the expertise, uh, the relative expertise at the given center or um, in the, uh, the availability of different medications in different countries. But Essentially, because it is a live donor transplant, you know the date of the anticipated transplant, and based on the antibody strength that you're crossing, whether it's anti-HLA antibody or anti-ABO antibody, you plan for preoperative preparation of the patient by um, eliminating circulating antibody, and in some cases also manipulating the B cell compartment. Here's an example of a protocol where we give plasmapheresis with uh, IVIG uh, every other day prior to the transplant. As you do this, you continue to check the antibody strength to make sure that there's no rebound between the plasmapheresis treatments and to make sure that the antibody, the circulating antibody strength remains low, and when you feel that the patient is ready for transplantation, uh, then you undergo the transplantation in the same way you normally would um, with uh, what we use as triple immunosuppression as well as induction immunosuppression. And then post-transplant, you continue to eliminate circulating antibody, um, and you continue to watch the antibody strength. If there's rebound here, uh, you can manipulate the the protocol. If there's evidence of antibody-mediated rejection, you can also manipulate the protocol. And we'll talk about AMR later um, later in the day. Uh, I want to go through some of the results of HLA incompatible desensitization because it's important to know what kind of risks the patients are taking, particularly when you're trying to choose between different available options. So, you know, whether the patient should undergo desensitization, whether they should undergo a kidney exchange, if this is allowable um, where they live, whether they should wait for a compatible deceased donor transplant, whether they should continue to seek a compatible donor. And so what we did is we gathered data from 21 centers across the United States, over 1,000 patients who underwent HLA incompatible transplants with desensitization. We categorize the antibody strengths according to three categories. Um, identifying cutoffs for Luminex or flow, uh, uh, flow crossmatch at various centers is challenging. And so basically we asked the centers to give us a very simple categorization. Was the patient cytotoxic positive or were they negative cytotoxic CDC cross match but had a positive flow cross match or were they negative flow cross match but had a positive Luminex uh, cross match and, and uh, had a positive Luminex assay. And based on these, we categorize people as uh, Luminex would be relatively low strength, flow would be moderate strength, and cytotoxic positive would be high strength. And then the first thing we did was we compared these patients to compatible recipients of live donor kidney transplants at those centers to ask the question, how much risk is associated with an HLA incompatible transplant compared to a compatible transplant? And what you see here is the uh, um, the graft loss over the first five years. The dark line here is compatible, and then you have the low strength, medium strength, and high strength antibody, so Luminex flow and cytotoxic antibody positive. And you see that as antibody strength increases, the risk of allograft loss increases as well. There's a very high risk the, the bulk of the risk increases very early after the transplant, presumably when these patients get in trouble with antibody res responses, antibody-mediated rejection, memory B-cell responses, et cetera. But even once you get past this early period, 
for cytotoxic positive cross-match patients in particular, there is always a continued risk of the antibody presence. And you can see by five years, this manifests to more than two times the risk of allograft loss. The same for the risk of mortality. Remember, these are high-risk patients who are undergoing complex uh, complex immune modulation. And you see, again, at five years uh, for positive cytotoxic cross-match, there's about a two-fold higher risk of mortality, although the lower antibody strengths seem to do quite, uh, quite well. And we can further quantify this. So this is from a paper we recently published in uh, AJT, where you see the risk in the first year and then the risk beyond the first year for graft loss and for mortality. And we can see that if it's just a positive Luminex with a negative flow cross match, these are very safe to do. Remember, these patients did undergo desensitization. So it's not necessarily safe to do without any immune modulation, but it's safe to do with immune modulation. Um, for those with a positive flow cross match, but a negative cytotoxic cross match, there is a risk, but the risk is not extremely high. For those with a positive cytotoxic cross match, in the first year, the risk is about five times higher that they'll get into trouble. And then beyond that first year, the risk drops substantially, but is not, but is always still present, which means the antibodies are always still threatening the allograft. <clears throat> So I show you data that says that putting somebody through desensitization or putting somebody through an incompatible kidney transplant is risky, particularly when the antibody strength is high. So why do we do it? Well, the question is one of survival benefit. So we're not asking the question, how do they survive with the transplant? We're asking the question, how do they survive with the transplant compared to their next best available options. And so a few years ago, we tried to answer this with our own questions, with, with our own patients. And what we did is we took 210 patients at Johns Hopkins that we put through desensitization with HLA incompatibilities. And then on the day that they got transplanted, we found other people who did not undergo desensitization and instead waited on the waiting list and either eventually got transplanted with a compatible transplant or never got transplanted. And what you see is that even though the risk is a little bit higher early on after desensitization, if you look at long-term outcomes, desensitization far outperforms waiting for a compatible transplant. In fact, those who underwent desensitization had twice the survival as those who waited for a compatible transplant. We extended this recently. So just last year, we published again in the New England Journal the comparison of those who underwent an HLA incompatible transplant to those who waited on the waiting list or those who received a transplant while waiting, those who did not receive a transplant while waiting. And again, in a thousand patients spread across 21 centers in the United States with different protocols, et cetera, we showed that there is twice the survival for undergoing desensitization compared to trying to wait for the next best available option. Um, this holds true for those who are positive Luminex, but with the negative flow cross match, and you see here the survival is high and the survival benefit is dramatic. For those with a positive flow but negative cytotoxic, you again see that the outcomes of the positive flow are not necessarily as good, but they're still much better than waiting for a compatible transplant. And for cytotoxic, again, the outcomes um, initially are, uh, are somewhat more risky, but then over time, there is still a significant survival benefit for those who undergo a positive cytotoxic crossmatch compared to those who wait for the next possible cross match. And when we look outside of Hopkins, so obviously we have a very large experience um, in terms of numbers and also in terms of the number of years we've been doing this. But if you look at all centers in the U.S. except Hopkins, that uh, effect still holds true. So that's one side of the piece is one thing we can do is take on the incompatibilities head on by doing desensitization. 
The other option is to try to exchange donors so that everybody ends up with compatible donors or at least better donors, and this reduces the immunologic risk. So this is trying to avoid the immunologic risk. In the United States, we have done kidney exchange in, it, um, in addition to the use of non-directed donors to start chains. And so when I talk to you about kidney exchange, I'm talking about traditional exchange as well as chains. And you see that non-directed donation in the United States has increased dramatically because of the involvement in kidney exchange. And if you take kidney exchange and you add it to the non-directed donors, in the US, since we started, we did the first one in 1999 at Hopkins. And since we started doing that, in the US, there have been almost 7,000 transplants through kidney exchanges. And today, kidney exchanges are almost 20% of the live donor transplants that we do in the United States. I wanna tell you about a few things that have evolved in kidney exchange um, so that people interested in starting a kidney exchange program understand the evolution of this, how this evolved at Hopkins, how it evolved nationally in the United States. The first thing that we've gotten much better at is helping, is helping to identify the matches. So ideally, you want to find people that match with each other. Um, this is the magnetic board that our coordinator, Janet Hiller, used to make the matches on. You can see that this was very low technology approach to doing this. Um, in 2005, in JAMA, we published a much higher technology way of doing this using a field of mathematics called optimization. Um, you don't need to understand the mathematics of this, but the reason I show you this is to emphasize that the mathematics have been worked out. There is software available for constructing kidney exchanges. There is multiple software available. We helped write the software for the United States and the software for Canada and for several other countries, um, as well as the software for smaller kidney exchange clearing houses as well. So suffice it to say that Anyone interested in conducting kidney exchange today has the technology available to them for free for doing this. Um, one of the limitations of traditional kidney exchange, so this, um, this here is a, an illustration of a traditional kidney exchange where you have, for example, an ABO incompatible pair and you have an HLA incompatible pair and neither of these can proceed without desensitization. But if donor two gives to recipient one and donor one gives to recipient two, then two compatible transplants can result. But there are limitations to this. One of the limitations is that there needs to be reciprocality, which means this donor has to, be, has to be compatible with this recipient and this donor has to be compatible with this recipient. And if that doesn't work out, then you can't conduct the traditional exchange. And the other thing that's required is they have to happen simultaneously, which means both donors have to go to the operating room at the same time. Otherwise, one donor might donate then this recipient already has received a transplant while this donor has not yet donated and then might say, oh, I'm sorry, I changed my mind. My recipient already has done very well. Why should I donate a kidney? And so the bringing both of these donors to the operating room at the same time prevents that kind of a problem from occurring. But this is a limitation for kidney exchange and one of the things that we've done in the United States, because we have non-directed donors available, is we've turned kidney exchanges into dominoes. And a domino is started by a non-directed donor, goes to a recipient of an incompatible pair, whose donor then donates to another recipient of an incompatible pair, et cetera. And this can go on for quite some time. And eventually, the last donor donates to the waiting list. So eventually somebody from the waiting list benefits from the fact that this happened, but in the meantime, the intermediate pairs all benefit from the fact that the non-directed donor is involved. And this helps us get around the reciprocality requirement because here, donor one is, is compatible with recipient two, but donor two is not compatible with recipient one. And this allows us to get across that 
reciprocality requirement. It also allows us to get across the requirement for simultaneous donation. So let's say these two, let's say these two donated and then we ask this donor to wait and hopefully he will continue the chain or the domino the next day. But if he changes his mind, this recipient still has his donor, this recipient still has his donor, so nobody loses from the fact that somebody changed their mind. And some have even proposed to continue these chains and continue them more and more and more, um, calling them never-ending chains, although realistically today, we don't like to ask these donors to wait very long before donating, and so these chains eventually all end in the waiting list. So there are two main ways of getting people with an incompatible donor transplanted. One is desensitization or taking on the antibodies. And the other one is kidney exchange or uh, cleverly avoiding the antibodies. So if both are available, which one should somebody choose? The advantages of de desensitization versus kidney exchange really boil down to the difference between PRA and DSA. So PRA is panel reactive antibody, and that measures how broad somebody is sensitized, which means what percent of the population would this person be expected to have a positive cross match with. And PRA dictates your ability to match. So if you have if you are broadly sensitized, you will have a much harder time finding a match in kidney exchange. Now, you might have a very high-strength donor-specific antibody to one particular antigen, but have a low PRA. Or you may have a high PRA, but not very much donor-specific antigen. And DSA, donor-specific antigen, is the antibodies that you have against a specific donor that we're considering you for. And this, as I've shown you, is what dictates your ability to undergo desensitization. We showed that with Luminex, you do well. With a positive flow, you do less well. And with a positive cytotoxic crossmatch, you do even less well. So that's your donor-specific antibody. That's your antibody against the specific donor that we're trying to use. And as DSA, goes higher, your ability to undergo desensitization drops. So PRA drives your ability to match in kidney exchange. DSA drives your ability to undergo desensitization. And when we meet patients in clinic, what we do is we categorize them as easy to desensitize or hard to desensitize. So as we saw, easy to desensitize is low strength, Luminex positive, hard to desensitize is high strength cytotoxic. And we also categorize them as easy to match in kidney exchange or hard to match in kidney exchange. And again, easy to match might be somebody with an O donor and a low PRA. Hard to match might be somebody with a high PRA, a non-O donor, an O recipient, et cetera. So we categorize people according to these phenotypes. And then we treat them according to the phenotype. So if they're easy to match and easy to desensitize, we try kidney exchange for a few months. And if there's a match, that's great, then we avoid desensitization. But if there's no match, it's not worth continuing to wait, and we just undergo desensitization directly because we know they will do well. If they're hard to desensitize but easy to match, we just have them continue to wait in the kidney exchange and eventually they will find a match because trying to desensitize them will be too harmful. If they're hard to match but easy to desensitize, well, we can look to see if there's a match immediately available, but this is probably not worth waiting and it's probably best to just do desensitization. If they're both hard to match and hard to desensitize, this is where the real challenge comes in. And for this, we use a hybrid approach where we combine kidney exchange and desensitization. And the motivation for this is that from any pool of recipients, many will not match. And these are the hard to match pairs. And what happens is in your, ex in your, in in your exchange pool, the hard to match pairs accumulate, and then your exchange pool becomes mostly 
broadly sensitized with people who are very, very difficult to find matches for. However, if instead of finding them a compatible transplant, we find them somebody that they have a low, tighter HLA antibody against, we know that results from that desensitization are good. Here's an example of the Canadian program, and you see the first eight, 16 months of their program, and then the area in red is PRA 97 and higher, and you see that the very highly sensitized patients very quickly accumulate in a kidney exchange program because they have a hard time finding matches. Instead of um, what we can do is instead of using a low antibody strength cutoff, so for example, here I'm illustrating a particular place we could use for antibody strength cutoff where we know that the patients would be um, flow negative, Luminex negative, et cetera, and we exclude all of these antibodies that have varying strengths. Instead, what we can do is raise that bar and allow some antibodies some anti-HLA antibody where there is relatively low strength here that we know we can cross with desensitization. And then we find the matches that will require a small amount of desensitization, but still much better than waiting for a compatible um, transplant. The last thing I'm gonna talk about is a new concept in kidney exchange called compatible pair donation, where instead of requiring somebody to be HLA or ABO incompatible prior to a kidney exchange, we allow compatible patients to benefit from kidney exchange as well. And here's the motivation behind that. So in a traditional kidney exchange, we have two incompatible pairs. They exchange and both recipients receive a compatible transplant. What if one of the pairs were compatible? What are some things you can benefit from for a compatible pair? And I'll give you an example. This is the first compatible kidney exchange we did at Hopkins. Um, it was in the newspaper, so I can give you the details about it. The 67-year-old man, who is an ex-president of a university, wanted to donate to his 42-year-old nephew. So he's much older than the intended recipient, and we know that that organ has a limited half-life. At the same time, but they're compatible. At the same time, there was an ABO HLA incompatible pair with a 38-year-old donor and a 63-year-old woman. So by exchanging these two, what happened was the 38-year-old gave to the 42-year-old, and the 42-year-old benefited by finding a younger donor. At the same time, the 67-year-old gave to the 63-year-old with whom he was compatible. So the 63-year-old got a compatible donor. One person got a younger donor. One person got a compatible donor. We know that younger donors do better. This is a study we published a few years ago. These are live donors in their 70s. These are live donors in their 50s. And we see that at 10 years, there's almost 50% higher allograft loss if you had an older donor. And so it is better to find a younger person a younger donor. What we do today, we just published in AJT last year, our live donor KDPI equation. And this is an equation to indicate to you how good of a quality of a donor there is. Now, I'm going to show you in the next talk how to evaluate donor risks. This takes donor characteristics and helps you evaluate recipient risks. And what you can do is you can use the live donor KDPI to show a pair of patients, to show them this is what will happen with your outcomes if you go from an older donor or a diabetic donor or a donor who has a lower GFR to somebody that has a better GFR. And so the old paradigm that we used to use was we would first check the blood type and check the HLA. And if they were found to be incompatible, we would exclude that donor, tell them to find a new donor, or do KPD, do a kidney exchange, or do desensitization. And if they were compatible, we would fo move forward and do the live donor transplant. Today, the new compatibility paradigm is first check the donor to see if they are eligible to donate. Don't worry about HLA or ABO incompatibilities. Once you 
demonstrate that they're eligible to donate, then you can identify the various incompatibilities. And so ABO and HLA are incompatibilities, but so is age. There is age incompatibility, nephron mass incompatibility, et cetera. And you can offer them to go into the kidney exchange to improve their donor regardless of whether the incompatibility was HLA incompatibility or ABO incompatibility or something we talked about like a physiologic incompatibility like age incompatibility. So in conclusion for this first lecture, we have gone over the problem of the incompatible pair. So the incompatible pair has a donor that cannot donate directly to the recipient yet the recipient wants a transplant. And the two major options for them are one, to undergo desensitization with an incompatible kidney transplant. We talked about how there's more risk as the antibody strength, the donor-specific antibody strength increases. Although if desensitization is all you have available, there is still very strong evidence of a survival benefit from desensitization. The second option is to avoid the incompatibility entirely and undergo a kidney exchange. And this is great if you can find somebody a match and the real challenge is finding people matches. I talked about some of the limitations of finding people matches, yet if you can find something, that is the best option for the patient. We have reduced these limitations by allowing, for example, non-directed donors to participate, compatible donors to participate, et cetera, to make kidney exchange available for as many people as possible. So um, thank you for uh, your attention on this first lecture. And I guess from what I heard, we will entertain some questions between lectures. And then if there's more time left at the end, um, we can answer general questions as well. We have 10 minutes for comments and questions. So I'm, I'm not sure whether I can control the other countries in terms of questions and comments, or you will do. Uh, anyway, anyone who has a comment or question, please raise your hand and then uh, we'll take it. So, anyone from Jordan, uh, Professor Dr. Butanna? Uh, thank you for the talk. A question about uh, patient and family satisfaction after uh, the exchanges with uh, bad outcomes when it comes to either rejection or, or something bad. So, uh, just your experience about that. Thanks. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so, Oh, can I make a request? Yeah, thank you. When, when you ask a question, if you mute, then I don't hear an echo of myself. Um, so when we counsel pe patients for a kidney exchange, um, we remind them that every transplant is like any other transplant, whether it's through an exchange or not. And I remind the donor that their goal was to donate to the intended recipient. And they should worry about the outcome of their intended recipient and not worry about the outcome of everybody else involved in the exchange. And I remind the recipient that their goal was to have their donor make a transplant possible for them. And whether it's their kidney or somebody else's kidney that we have found for them the best kidney possible for them immunologically and physiologically, and that nothing is perfect. Everybody knows that there's some failure rates, there's rejection rates, et cetera, after a transplant, and they shouldn't worry about where the kidney came from. If they have a rejection, it's the reality of doing the transplant, and they shouldn't look to blame the donor for that. It's the recipient's immune system that's causing that rejection. It's difficult to do this because we will, as a practice, allow people to meet the other recipients involved in a kidney exchange, which means that if a year from now they stay in touch and they found, find out that one of the organs was lost, then everybody involved feels a little bit depressed for the person who lost their organ. But again, I remind them that in the, the standard way of thinking about a transplant is... A donor donates a kidney, a recipient 
receives a kidney, and there is not 100% guarantee that that transplant will occur. With that kind of counseling, we've actually not really experienced any terrible family stories, even when things have happened um, and uh, outcomes have not been great after these transplants. Ruth, Palestine, Baghdad, Gaza. Uh, excuse me, gentlemen, if I just make, make a suggestion, I think it would be uh, the most beneficial for all of us to, uh, to go location by location in order to determine what questions will be asked. So, uh, if I'm correct, Jordan just asked questions. So, uh, if, if there are no more further questions from Jordan, uh, we can just maybe move on to a different location. Are there any more questions from Jordan? Okay, uh, are there any questions from Gaza? Okay, if there are no questions from Gaza, I'm going to mute Gaza. Uh, are there any questions from Beirut? Uh, thanks for comprehensive uh, presentation. I'm Dr. Kishawi from Gaza, Palestine. Uh, just I would like to ask about uh, the regarding the AB incompatibility. I saw in UK that they used immune absorption, uh, rituximab, and IVIG. How percent it's useful for AB incompatibility for graft survival? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the topic I was asked to cover was HLA incompatibility, but indeed the same type of desensitization protocol can be used for ABO incompatibility. And in fact, the high rates, and we'll talk about this later when we talk about AMR, the high rates of AMR that we see with HLA incompatibility are not as much of a problem with ABO incompatibility. And in general, the same kind of desensitization protocols have very good success to address ABO incompatibilities. And um, I would refer you to several papers that we've written um, in the last decade talking about our protocol and about the number of plasmapheresis treatments, et cetera, that people need based on their initial ABO titer. Now, unfortunately, in the United States, we don't have access to immunoabsorption, so I can't talk directly about our experience with it, although my understanding is that the immunoabsorption columns work very well, and I wish we had access to them, and I would recommend, if those are available, to um, refer to the literature from Sweden and from the UK on the use of these columns um, and the success that they've had with ABO incompatible transplants. So I definitely um, support the concept of ABO incompatible transplants and think that these are a uh, realistic um, endeavor for somebody that has a good, uh, good facilities for doing this. Okay, uh, are there any more questions from the Gaza location? There's a question from Syria. If you have a question, you may unmute yourself and ask. Yes, I am Dr. Bassam Said from Syria. My question is uh, regarding the certain limitations of the uh, kidney exchange program. Actually, especially when it comes to uh, Middle East and certain countries in the Middle East with limited resources, we do not have uh, uh, certain similarities between different transplant services and uh, transplant programs. I mean that uh, uh, facilities are not, uh, are not similar. We, we may have certain things in some center, not in other centers. I think uh, we, we, we do have certain, uh, uh, certain uh, similarity in facilities and lab techniques in all these centers in order to to have this uh, kidney exchange succeed in our this, our countries. This is one point. The other point is regarding the pool. I mean, um, if the pool is large, uh, 
uh, we have more chance for this kidney exchange program to succeed. But if we are talking about uh, countries where we have small, uh, small, smaller pool, I think the, the chance and the, 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 the options to find out some uh, matching donors will be much less. And then here we can wonder about the success of such programs if we apply here in our places. Thank you. Yeah, those are two great points. Um, with regard to the pool size, obviously the bigger the pool, the higher the chances are for successful matches. And in particular, the higher the chances are for successful compatible matches. Although if you allow a combination of kidney exchange and desensitization, then you may have more success with this. But bear in mind that our neighbor to the north, Canada, has a much smaller population and a much smaller kidney exchange program, yet has been very successful in facilitating kidneys, kidney exchanges. And in fact, in the United States, not everyone participates in a multi-center program. And we have some very strong single center programs as well. For example, there's one program in Texas that only does exchanges within their transplant center, and they have accomplished many, many kidney exchanges. And so the, the large scale model, while it's a good option, is not the only way to conduct the kidney exchanges. And I tell people when they ask me, how many pairs do you need for a successful kidney exchange program? I say, you need two pairs as long as they match, meaning that if you can find matches within a small number of patients, like people have done, then you will help patients move forward. Now, it is true that different centers have different technologies and different um, resources available. And for example, in some places where they do kidney exchange, some centers offer a laparoscopic donation and some centers only offer an open donation. And the advice I give people is this. If a donor and a recipient come to your center, then you, your center is responsible for the donor and the recipient for recipient okay, okay. testing. Okay, good, yeah. For recipient testing and also yeah. for... Uh, yeah, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure who was coordinating. Okay, so I'll unmute Jordan then. Okay, whoever, okay. I, I hear some of the technicians okay, on the line. You. Thank you. Please mute your line. Um, okay, anyway, so if a recipient and a donor come to your center, then you are responsible for recipient testing with whatever technologies are available at your center and you determine for potential donors that are offered for exchange whether your recipient is compatible, whether you can undergo a kidney exchange, etc. cetera. Um, your donor, you will operate on your donor in the same way you would have operated on the donor if they were compatible and then you take the kidney and you ship it to the recipient center from the exchange transplant. And this allows your donor to stay with you, your recipient to stay with you, your patients to undergo the same resources and technology that they would have underwent if, you were, if they were compatible, yet it still allows a kidney exchange to occur. And that's how we've recommended that people do this from heterogeneous environments. I think as, as we started a bit late, um, we're running short of time, so we have to move to the next talk, uh, which will be presented by Dr. Ahem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Professor Dori, for your uh, presentations, which is actually very nice and interesting. Uh, now we'll move to another talk that's actually interesting as well. Uh, Professor Dory will be talking about live kidney donor risk prediction, new paradigm and new calculators. So, Professor Dory, uh, you are most welcome again. Thank you. And um, I'm actually very excited to talk about this topic because I was just involved in the new KDGO guidelines for live donor evaluation. And I'm going to present to you an exciting new paradigm for evaluating live donor risk. And we are moving from 
a um, from a paradigm where we looked at patients with a potential donors in single organ systems, and we're new, moving now to a very data-driven, calculator-driven paradigm. And this is very exciting. And for those of you who have not yet seen the new KDGO guidelines, this will be an overview of those guidelines. Why do we worry about live donor risk? Well, when Joe Murray did the first kidney transplant in the world, he described this during the lecture that he gave for his Nobel Prize. And he said, for the first time in medical history, a normal, healthy person was to be subjected to a major surgical operation, not for his own benefit. What this means is that we take donors' risk every time we operate on a kidney donor, and that donor does not need that operation. And so we need to be very mindful of our obligations to the donor. And our obligations are, one, to do no harm. Now, obviously, we put them at risk, so we know we are doing some harm, but this is to minimize our harm and to be fair and to give them privacy, etc. And we have to remember also that the donors have the right, which means if we tell somebody they cannot donate, we are telling them that they don't have the right to act for the benefit of somebody else and the right to autonomy, which is the right to make an informed, uncoerced decision. And so we have to very carefully balance these obligations that we have and the rights that the donors have in a consistent and defensible way. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. When I was trained on how to talk to kidney donors, I was told that you should tell donors your risk of kidney failure after donation is no higher than the general population. Well, this never really made much sense to me because donors are not drawn from the general population. Donors are very highly selected after careful medical evaluation. And so really the comparison group for donors is not the general population. If I were considering donating a kidney, I would ask three questions. One is, what is my baseline risk? And what I mean by that is, what is the risk that I will get kidney failure, that I will die, that I will have a complication if I don't donate? And then the absolute risk is, what is the risk that I will have these things if I do donate? And then what's the difference? What is the extra risk that I'm undergoing by donating, and we call that the attributable risk. And ideally, I would want to know that for somebody like me, so by race, age, sex, BMI, GFR, etc. Answering these questions is not easy, okay? So baseline risk, what we should do, ideally, we should look at people who were cleared to donate, but then did not donate, and we should follow them for many years and see what happened. But that's a very small number of people. So instead, what we've done is we've taken our inferences from what we call healthy non-donors. And I'll talk to you a little bit later about the KDGO guidelines and the New England Journal paper that we recently published looking at healthy non-donors. To understand the absolute risk, we just study donors. And if we have enough donors, we can look at the absolute risk of kidney failure. And then if we look at the difference between the two, so the risk in the donors minus the risk in the healthy non-donors, that's the extra risk that somebody takes by donating. The problem with studying outcomes in kidney donors is that these are rare events. Death, ESRD after donation, these are very rare events for kidney donors, which is good because that means that it's justifiable to let somebody donate a kidney, but it's also challenging, which means that we need thousands of donors to see one event and tens of thousands of donors to estimate that risk with any degree of confidence, and particularly for any subgroups. We also need a non-self-reported source. And so, you know, in some centers, sure, it's possible to, to connect with the donors 15 years after they donate. But in many cases, 
The centers lose touch with the donors and we need another way to determine whether they're alive and whether they have kidney failure. And then you need national representation. So you want representation across the entire spectrum of donors. Instead of just looking at donors at one center where you're very limited, we turned to big data. And I'm gonna tell you about several publications two in JAMA in the, in the last few years and one in the New England Journal last year, where we looked at, used big data to answer this question. One data that we have in the United States that is to our advantage is we have a registry of every single live donor who's donated in the United States since 1988. Today, actually, the slide is a little bit old. Today, actually, there are about 130,000 live donors. This is a high advantage because we have every single person who's donated, not just people who've agreed to participate in research studies, but the registry does not follow donors after donation. The registry only gathers the baseline information about the donors. So what we had to do in order to make this registry useful is we had to link to two other data sources. One is called Medicare, and Medicare knows every single person in the United States who has kidney failure because Medicare pays for dialysis and for transplantation. And so we have a national source to determine whether the donors developed kidney failure eventually. And the second one that we have is the Social Security Death Master File. So the U.S. government knows who is alive and who is dead. And so what this means is that 15 years after somebody donates, even if we don't know their phone number, if we can't find them on social media, if we can't reach them by mail, we can look through Medicare to see if they developed ESRD, and we can look through Social Security to see if they're still alive. So now we can study mortality and, gra and uh, uh, kidney failure in kidney donors. Remember the comparison group is healthy non-donors. And again, only people who have cleared the donor evaluation is too small a group to study this. But we can look at major medical studies like what we call NHANES, which is the National Health and Nutrition Evaluation Survey. This is a US government study where they took 30,000 people, did very detailed medical evaluations on them, and that's it. So there's no follow-up for these patients, but there's a lot of medical information. And what we did here was we took the same medical evaluation, and this is very detailed in the kind of medical evaluation we do for donors. We identified from this group people that we think would have passed a donor evaluation, called them healthy non-donors, and again, linked them to the same sources, Medicare and Social Security, to allow us to determine whether these healthy individuals developed kidney failure or died. The first study we published in JAMA in 2010 was a study of mortality. So we looked at 80,000 live donors. That's how many we had in the, the database back then. And we were able to answer these questions and show that the mortality rate from donating a kidney in the first 90 days is three per 10,000. It varies by the characteristics of the donor, but it is still very, very low. And when we compared the donors to matched non-donor controls, we found that actually the survival in kidney donors was slightly better than the survival in matched controls. And this could mean one of two things. It could either mean, one, that the donors were even healthier than the matched controls, which means we put them through a very, very rigorous evaluation process, and we found them to be even healthier than what we were able to identify in the matched controls, or that by donating a kidney, now the donors are more careful, they see a doctor on a regular basis, they identify potential medical problems and get them, get them dealt with early on, and so they actually do better in terms of their outcomes. One of the two is driving this finding. But certainly, one thing we showed was that donors did not have 
a higher risk of death than their match controls. When we sent that to JAMA in 2010, obviously their biggest question was, well, what about kidney failure in donors because they are giving up half of their nephron mass? Can we estimate the risk associated with donation for kidney failure? And again, remember that at this time, we were telling people that your risk of kidney failure is no higher than the general population, but the general population was a very bad comparison group. And sure enough, when we looked at 100,000 donors and we compared the donors to healthy non-donors, we found that the risk at 15 years of kidney failure in a donor is 31 per 10,000 and in a healthy non-donor is only four per 10,000. So there is extra risk of kidney failure from donating a kidney. Now it's very low, but it's still there. And we also showed that it varies by donor characteristics. And so, for example, this is the variation by race. And we see that black donors have a much higher risk of kidney failure than Hispanic or white donors, meaning that they, we need to be able to tell people, individualized to them, what is the risk of getting kidney failure after donating. Now, again, we can subtract the post-donation risk minus the risk in healthy non-donors, and then we get that extra risk. And here we can show that the extra risk is highest in black donors. But remember, we didn't just want a general number. We wanted a personalized number. So for somebody's, if they are black and 56 years old and female with a BMI of 28 and a GFR of 90, what is their baseline absolute and attributable risk? And for that, we turn to even bigger data because we have to very carefully characterize the healthy non-donor population that helps us estimate the baseline risk. And the bigger data that we went to is what's called the CKD prognosis consortium. This is a consortium of many, many CKD cohorts and general population cohorts. And I'm just going to give you a sense of these. These are the cohorts from all over the world, general population cohorts, high risk cohorts, CKD cohorts, etc. There are millions of patients in the CKD prognosis consortium. Unlike the donors where we only had 130,000, there are millions of patients in this. And so we can make very granular, personalized predictions for people. And so here's what we did. We just published this last year in the New England Journal. We started with a base case. This is the uh, albumin to creatinine ratio, blood pressure, diabetes, hypertension, et cetera. These are the characteristics of the base case with an age-based base case GFR. And then we said for these patients, patients with these characteristics, if we vary their age and we vary the race and the sex, what is the lifetime incidence of getting end-stage kidney disease with these patients. And we, in the base case scenario, this is the lifetime incidence. So if you're a 60 year old white woman, your lifetime incidence is 0.14%. If you're a 30 year old black male who's otherwise healthy, your lifetime incidence is 1.2%. And so we were able to calculate all of those things. And then we took all of the additional risk factors in what we call a meta regression where we added all of these risk factors to the various cohorts that we were evaluating to see what is the impact, for example, of higher BMI, of higher G or lower GFR, of higher blood pressure, of non-insulin dependent diabetes, et cetera. And then we were able to actually make figures like this where we say, okay, here's your baseline risk. If you say also now your GFR is lower, then your risk increases significantly. So for example, if your baseline, if you are white and male and your GFR is 90, then your baseline risk is about 0.4% lifetime risk. If your GFR is 60, now your base time, baseline risk is about 2% lifetime risk. So we were able to look at the impact of, for example, lower GFR, the impact of BMI, which is really important, 
the impact of smoking, and even, for example, the impact of non-insulin dependent diabetes. And I'm going to point something out that I think is very important. So nobody that I know would allow a 60-year-old woman with diabetes to donate a kidney. Yet, that 60-year-old woman with diabetes has about a 0.5% lifetime risk of getting ESRD if she donates. Everybody I know would allow a healthy 40-year-old black male to donate a kidney. Yet, that black male, even if he doesn't have diabetes, has a 1% lifetime risk of end-stage kidney disease. So twice as high as this white 60-year-old diabetic woman. Yet we allow him to donate and we don't allow her to donate. And the reason is that we see things as single organ system. We say never diabetes, never hypertension, never BMI over 35, rather than putting the entire picture together. And so now we actually have a calculator. You can see the website there. The calculator is described in the New England Journal of Medicine paper. And this calculator allows you to enter all of the characteristics of a potential donor and to ask, what is that potential donor's pre-donation, 15-year and lifetime risk of getting ESRD? So now, we can say, well, we will allow a BMI of 35 only if there are none of these other risk factors. But as you build risk factors, then we won't allow a higher BMI. Now, this is all baseline risk. So remember, there's baseline risk, and that's pre-donation, and there's post-donation risk. So this is the risk if they don't donate a kidney. And what we've been doing recently is also calculating the risk if they do donate a kidney. And so we've looked at, we just published this a couple of months ago in Jason, we looked at 130,000 donors in the United States over a 20-year period, and we asked questions like, what is the impact of higher BMI on ESRD if you donate? What is the impact of being related to your recipient compared to not being related, et cetera? And we also have a new calculator for post-donation risk. So I just showed you pre-donation risk calculator. I'm showing you a post-donation risk calculator right now. And you can see the impact of sex and of race and of age and of BMI and being related to the recipient, et cetera. Um, and one of the things that we show is that, the, that we let people donate who have a very, very wide range of ESRD. And you can see that in this figure. And I won't spend too much time dwelling on this figure, but I will say that we allow individuals to donate who have a very wide risk of ESRD, very wide range of ESRD risk. I showed you the 60-year-old healthy white woman who has a risk of 0.14%, and I showed you the healthy African-American male in their 30s who has a risk of 2 or 3%, and then you add BMI to that, and maybe they have a risk of 5 or 6%. We currently decline potential donors who have conditions associated with a very wide range of ESRD risk. So we will say, for example, nobody with non-insulin dependent diabetes can donate. Yet, remember, I showed you if you're old and you're white and you have no other medical problems, then non-insulin dependent diabetes is not a big deal at all and is not too risky to allow you to donate. Yet we decline those people because, again, we've been looking at things with a very different paradigm. We currently accept donors who have much higher risks than donors who we decline. So remember, I showed you 40-year-old black donor, we will accept with no problems, yet his risk is still twice as high as the older white female with diabetes who we will never accept. And there is a new acceptable risk paradigm. This is in the new KDGO guidelines. This was just published in the last month or two. Um, you can read the executive summary, which will summarize the things that I just talked about here. You can read the 200, 300 pages of details as well. Um, again, both of those are published. And the new KDGO guidelines have shifted the paradigm from single organ system to data-driven, big data-driven, 
calculators that are um, empirical and uh, much easier to use. And we are actually, many centers are in the process of um, adapting our center thinking about live donor evaluation to using this calculator. Um, so thank you. And uh, uh, again, I'm pleased to take questions about this particular talk. Thank you, Professor Dory. This was a very interesting talk as we usually uh, evaluate our donors to be fit at time of donation. But as you mentioned, we do not look further after that much. So uh, we have 10 minutes for questions or comments to start by alphabetical orders in Amman. Okay, yeah. thank you for this uh, great uh, lecture. Uh, my question is in your evaluation when you put the calculator model, uh, would it be, I mean, I don't know if you recommend including uh, the family history of, uh, of, the, of the patient or the donor, uh, because glomerulonephritis, especially FSGS, was at one point contraindication, or not contraindication, you, must, you, you need to be careful um, of donating a kidney because the risk of collapsing FSGS happening 10 years post uh, kidney donation. I don't know, what do you think of that? Adding it in the calculation. Yeah, that's a very good question and something we would like to do and something we're currently in the process of evaluating. Um, unfortunately, the data we got from CKD Prognosis Consortium, there were very few cohorts that had family history data. Um, in the donors, the donor data set, we don't have family history data at all, but we did find recently, and I showed you some of the data, that if you are related to your recipient, you have a higher risk of getting kidney failure because presumably you share some of this familial or genetic risk. So two things that we're trying to incorporate into the calculator that hopefully you'll see soon. One is whatever we know about genetic uh, testing. So in black donors, we're very interested in APOL1 today, and there will be many, much more data about this in the next few years. And the second is we're trying to get better family history data and incorporate family history into the calculators as well. Unfortunately, right now, we don't have the data to do this, so you're sort of stuck without incorporating that. And what that means is when you think about your donor, remember that these decisions are not made by websites and calculators and New England journal papers and KDGO guidelines. They're made by doctors like us. And so if I see somebody who has some other risk factors and also a very strong family history, for example, let's say a 20-year-old black male with a BMI of 30 who already has some pre-hypertension and a strong family history of hypertension and kidney disease, that would not be a very good donor, no matter what the calculator says. Uh, so thank you. For the calculator in your center, what's the acceptable risk then when you, you, know, you do the calculations? Can you have all these colors about the, the risk? Yeah, that's, that's also a very good question and one that we don't have a very good answer for. So there's two risks that we're calculating, right? One is what is the baseline risk? And two is what is the risk? So that's what is the risk if you don't donate? And two is what is the risk if you do donate? Now, some people have said we should draw the line and say no more than 5% risk if you donate, that you will develop ESRD in your lifetime. Some people say it should be a 10% risk. Some people say we should only look at the baseline and not the post-donation risk, et cetera. In our center, we try not to put draw a line. And what we say is this. We have nurses who screen potential donors because we get many phone calls from donors. We say, if the screen shows that the risk is less than 2%, then move forward with the donor evaluation and do a very careful medical workup for that donor. If the screen shows that the risk is more than 2%, then have the team review the information about the donor before continuing, to, uh, continuing with their evaluation. But no matter what the calculator shows, 
at the end, when we've seen the donor, done the CAT scan, looked at the family history, understood the medical history of the donor, we sit down every single donor and talk about them as a team and decide if we think that they're acceptable. Um, I will say that there's a new concept for donor risk that we just published in the American Journal of Transplantation called um, tangible benefit to the donor. So up until recently, we've always assumed that the donor donates, they take risk only on, the ha on behalf of the recipient, and they have no benefit from donating. But obviously, this is not true, because if my wife were on dialysis, and my wife stopped working, and my wife couldn't contribute to raising the children and to everything else that we do. And by donating to her, now I get my wife back. Now I have a functional partner, and our partnership improves, then I derive a huge benefit from donating. And so another thing that we do in our center with our committee is if somebody is donating to a stranger, or to a friend that they never see, we will draw the line lower. If somebody is donating to their spouse or somebody they live with where they will have a tangible benefit, then we might say, we will accept a slightly higher risk for this donor because this donor actually has real benefit from donating. Okay, to move on alphabetical order, if uh, Baghdad have uh, any questions, Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Segev, for uh, this very comprehensive presentation about the KDPI. Uh, I would like to uh, highlight some point regarding that the most of the study that the KD, recently published KDGO guidelines dependent on where U.S. based the study, and uh, they recom the KDGO recommended that every single center should strive to have their quantitative threshold for estimating the future risk of developing complication post-donation. So in the view of limited resources, we are not in the United States. What's your suggestion for uh, newly, and, uh, newly established and developing centers in the, in the Middle East to go uh, uh, to keep pace with the KDGO guidelines? And the other point, what's your suggestion regarding the using of APOL testing for African American and those with a specific family history. Thank you. Yeah, great questions. Um, and unfortunately, there is a limitation in the sources of data for the new KDGO guidelines. And many of many of the cohorts were either from the US or from Europe. And so the diversity of uh, representation in these um, in these guidelines is limited. And I agree that it is only partially helpful to use data from the United States or from Europe to inform decisions about donors in the Middle East. So I think there are two things we can say to that. One is, at least by using these calculators, you will have a sense of who is much higher risk and who is much lower risk. And we've learned, for example, the impact of BMI, the impact of G decreased GFR, et cetera. We've learned this much better than we knew this before we wrote the New England Journal paper, before we did the study, before we wrote the KDGO guidelines. So at least it can help guide these decisions, if not be exact in terms of the risk that it is estimating. I will say, and I have you know, spoken about these guidelines all over the world and everywhere I speak about this, I encourage people to try to create registries of donors in your area. So whether it's donors at your transplant center, donors in your country, donors in the Middle East, etc., and start to study these donors to give yourself a sense of do these donors follow the patterns of what is published from other populations? Or is there something different about donors in the Middle East that people who practice in the Middle East need to understand? And you have a Middle East uh, uh, transplant society, Middle East nephrology societies. I think if it's possible to put together registries where you draw data from different centers and you try to learn more about whether 
donors from the Middle East follow the same patterns, if that's possible to do, I think you will learn a lot about, um, uh, you will be able to improve donor selection in the Middle East. Okay. Uh, Beirut, do you have any questions? Okay. Damascus? Yes, yes, we yes, we have. Uh, where, please? Uh, thanks again. Uh, my question is: Can we? Can we? Sorry. Uh, can we set up? Can we set up a, a cutoff regarding the uh, estimated or measured GFR for certain uh, donors before saying yes, we approve or we disapprove the donation? Yeah. So GFR is a tricky one because there are multiple ways to measure GFR. You can use estimated GFR from MDRD or the other estimating equations. You can do 24-hour creatinine clearance. You can do iothalamate or other nuclear scans. And each one of these is different, and we don't really know how useful they are in the normal range of GFR, right? The MDRD equation was developed for people with CKD, not healthy, normal individuals. And how good is, is it at differentiating between somebody who has a GFR of 80 and somebody who has a GFR of 100. So I think the testing method already is confusing and is not particularly, um, doesn't allow for uh, us to compare donors across the board. In terms of where the cutoff should be, obviously if somebody has an estimated GFR of 60, this is not somebody who should be a good donor. This is somebody who should be uh, cared for by a nephrologist with chronic kidney disease. Whether the cutoff should be 80, should be 90, should be higher for younger donors. Some people make a, a higher cutoff and some people don't. Um, at our center for the very young donors, we would like the GFR to be over 100 as they get older. We go to 90 as they get older, we go to 80. But recently we've even been talking about reducing these more. And again, if somebody is not quite at the, G, at the GFR mark, but otherwise has absolutely no evidence of ongoing disease, no evidence of kidney dysfunction, no evidence of family history, et cetera, we would allow an even lower GFR for the purposes of donation. Okay. Our friends and colleagues in Palestine, do you have any question? Oh. Uh, by this, uh, thank you, Professor Dari, for this uh, new interesting presentation. Hello again. Um, Professor Dari will have the uh, last uh, talk before the coffee break, and it will be about diagnosis and treatment of antibody mediated rejection and chronic. AMR. Professor Dari again. Um, thank you once again. And uh, uh, I'm also excited to present this lecture um, on an area of kidney transplantation that is challenging to all of us. Um, so my goal with this lecture is to cover the spectrum of AMR all the way from subclinical AMR <clears throat> through to um, uh, aggressive, early, severe AMR, traditional clinical AMR. <clears throat> I'll talk about C4, C4D negative and positive AMRs, and then late AMR, or what some people will call chronic AMR. <clears throat> and for each of these, I'll try to indicate something about what we know about the, um, the implications of this pathologic process, and then something about the treatment of this pathologic process. I will start by saying that the treatment for AMR is very wide. There are many different protocols for treating AMR. Nobody's really compared these protocols in a good randomized trial, and so basically, what happens is whatever the area of comfort and expertise 
of a given center is how AMR is treated in that center. At our center, traditionally, we treat AMR with plasmapheresis and with um, treatment of any concomitant cellular rejection. And if necessary, I'll tell you about some of the other escalations that we have in terms of the treatment of AMR. There are other places that use rituximab. There are places that only use thymoglobulin for treatment of AMR. There are places that use bortezomib. There's new drugs called like eculizumab and other complement inhibitors, et cetera. I'm gonna touch on them somewhat in the context of some of the things that we've looked at, but remember that the spectrum is wide and really in terms of treatment of AMR, you need to decide what your center is comfortable with and what medications your center has access to um, uh, because the, the, the palette for AMR treatment changes quite often. So let's first talk about subclinical AMR. And the only reason I bring up this topic is that I think it's really important to remember that subclinical AMR has an impact on the allograft and on the patient. And this is um, work published a couple of years ago by the Paris Transplant Group. And you see here, this is graft survival for people who had no rejection, people who had subclinical T cell mediated rejection and subclinical antibody mediated rejection. And those with subclinical antibody mediated rejection did not do very well. You see they had a lower uh, GFR. Um, now they did better than those with clinical antibody-mediated rejection, but they still had problems. Um, they still lost their allografts. They still developed proteinuria. So when you're taking on transplants where there is a high risk for AMR, and we'll talk a little bit later about which those transplants are, it is actually recommended to, um, to do protocol biopsies do surveillance for subclinical AMR and treat subclinical AMR if you find it because it can impact the allograft. The worst kind of AMR that we see is what we call severe clinical AMR. Now, I'm going to differentiate this from clinical AMR biologically and of clinical phenotype. So the biology is that this is a B, memory B cell response. It occurs in the first week to 10 days after a transplant, and you see immediate oliguria or aneuria, an immediate decrease in the function of the kidney. So either the creatinine, um, the creatinine drop stops or the creatinine will rise. Detectable donor-specific antibody and pathologic changes of AMR. This is a very very bad occurrence for the allograft. And if this goes untreated, the allograft will be lost. We learned this many times the hard way. And so again, I show you a volcano with lava inside the volcano to remind you that severe clinical AMR is a very, very difficult um, and dangerous situation for the allograft. 10 years ago, we treated severe clinical AMR with splenectomy. And what we showed was that in those who did not undergo a splenectomy, even if they got aggressive plasmapheresis, rituximab, et cetera, they lost the allografts. While those who did undergo a splenectomy, while they had very high creatinines and very high donor-specific antibody, at the time that their AMR was diagnosed, those who underwent splenectomy had recovery of their antibody-mediated process, and you can see this pathologically as well. So this was our first indication that treatment for this severe AMR phenotype needed to be swift and aggressive, and in this case, we were using splenectomy at the time. Now, splenectomy in somebody who's undergone a lot of plasmapheresis and desensitization and might not be physiologically very robust can be a dangerous operation. So when complement inhibition 
started to become a reality for transplant patients, we looked to see if we could use complement inhibitors instead of splenectomy for um, patients who had severe AMR. And the, the, the purpose of the complement inhibitor is to block the effector mechanism of the AMR, which means to not let the antibodies cause damage to the allograft and buy us more time to eliminate the circulating antibodies with plasmapheresis and everything else that we do. And here again is another case example of this where somebody got uh, desensitized and they did very well um, after the, the transplant. And then immediately we see that, um, that they had oliguria and didn't do very well. And we noticed that the cross match, the donor specific antibody titers went up dramatically. And then we treated with the eculizumab. Um, and then uh, the titers, the donor specific antibody resolved very nicely um, after we were able to remove that. And in the meantime, we were able to watch the uh, allograft recover its function. We then compared eculizumab and splenectomy. So this is the most recent publication of this, where you see that in those um, who have an overwhelming antibody response, Remember that these antibodies are coming from memory B cells, which often come in the spleen and are hidden in the spleen. And so if you are able to stop the effector mechanism with the eculizumab, debulk the memory B cell compartment with splenectomy, and then remove circulating antibody with plasmapheresis, you can get incredible success in the treatment of these very, very aggressive uh, uh, early AMRs, look at the urine output here, just dropping to almost zero within a couple of days of doing the transplant. Early diagnosis, early aggressive treatment, and the severe AMR can be uh, treated. One thing we've done recently is for those who we don't think can tolerate the actual operation of a splenectomy, we do splenic irradiation, which again helps us debulk that B cell compartment. So that is a relatively rare but incredibly impactful um, version of AMR that happens early and that is mediated by a memory B cell response. Let's talk more about the regular garden variety clinical AMR. We wanted to understand what the impact was of AMR on allograft loss. And so we did this study a couple of years ago where we looked at 2,300 patients that we transplanted of whom 220 developed AMR. 77 were subclinical, 142 were clinical. And on average, the AMR occurred at about 15 days. Remember, this is not that severe memory B cell response at seven days. This is at about two weeks where you would start to see um, antibody, the regular antibody responses to the allografts. We followed patients for about five years and we compared those who developed AMR with match controls who did not develop AMR. And we looked to see, did the type of transplant that they had affect the impact of the AMR? Were there different outcomes, different mechanisms, et cetera? Remember that we take on HLA and compatible transplants, and we know that there's more graft loss when, um, when we do an HLA and compatible transplant. And obviously, a lot of these graft losses come through antibody-mediated rejection. And what you're looking at here is the incidence of AMR in different transplant types. So in a compatible deceased donor transplant, only 1.7% of our patients had AMR. In an HLA incompatible deceased donor transplant, almost half of the patients had AMR. In a compatible live donor transplant, almost 0% had AMR. We talked earlier about ABO incompatibility, and remember that I said that the risk with ABO incompatible transplants is not nearly as high as with HLA incompatible, and you see that here, only 13% AMR with ABO incompatible transplants, 
almost 50% AMR with HLA and compatible transplants. And so when we talk about AMR, we need to think about AMR in the context of what were the pre-existing antibody risks in the recipient. Now, when we look at overall impact of AMR, we can see that the top line is those who had clinical AMR, and then the line underneath it is those who had subclinical AMR, and then you see the match controls. And what you can see is there is definitely higher risk of graft loss in people who have AMR, and we can quantify this and control for all of the recipient characteristics. And here's what you see. In a deceased donor situation, if they're compatible, there's about a fourfold higher risk of allograft loss if they have AMR. Remember, it's rare, but there is definitely a risk. Um, there is less of a risk if it's an HLA incompatible deceased donor transplant. Again, the reason is that we are comparing them, those who got AMR to those who didn't get AMR. And um, when we take on HLA incompatibilities in deceased donor transplants, we don't take on very high strength incompatibilities. The impact on somebody who's ABO incompatible or HLA incompatible is quite high. There were not enough AMRs in the compatible live donor group to assess this. But essentially, those who get AMR have about five times the risk of losing their allograft as those who don't. So this reminds us that we need to treat the AMR, diagnose the AMR early, treat the AMR early as well. Um, and the spectrum for treatment can be anywhere from plasmapheresis and IVIG, thymoglobulin, eculizumab, uh, rituximab, bortezomib, et cetera. And in fact, there is a new agent. This was just published in the New England Journal about two weeks ago. There is a new agent um, called IDES, which is IgG endopeptidase. This report was not about treatment of AMR, but was about prevention of AMR in highly sensitized patients undergoing transplantation. But I suspect that given the mechanism of this agent, it might prove itself useful for the treatment of AMR as well, but we don't have data for this right now. But this is probably one of the more exciting new agents. We talked mostly about C4D positive AMR, but recently, there's been the realization that C4D is not a necessary component of a harmful antibody-mediated rejection. Um, back in the 1990s, when the BANF classification um, added AMR as a criteria for rejection, it was, um, it was required that there be C4D deposition for the definition of AMR. Recently, um, there's been evidence that there are C4D negative um, physiology of uh, AMR, and the new 2013 BANF guidelines, um, they said uh, C4D negative AMR is defined by microvascular injury, so glomerulitis, peritubular capillaritis, uh, TMA, the same things, in the presence of donor-specific antibody, but without C4D staining, and they said it was felt overwhelmingly that C4D negative AMR be incorporated into the BANF classification. So you don't need to be C4D positive. We looked at our own patients and the presentation of C4D negative AMR and the outcomes from those, and we compared 50 patients who had C4D negative AMR with 150 patients who had C4D positive AMR. And um, you can see the, uh, the induction that they got and the type of antibody that they had and whether they had clinical AMR and whether the AMR was treated. Interestingly, early on, because C4D was a requirement for diagnosis of AMR, early on, many of our C4D negative AMRs were not even treated, um, but are, going, are being treated today. Here is the BANF classification um, for AMR, and you see uh, that, um, that uh, C4D positivity is not necessarily um, one of the requirements. Instead of requiring C4D staining, you either have C4D staining 
or microvascular inflammation or um, gene transcripts uh, indicative of endothelial injury. One thing that's very interesting that was published by the Paris Transplant Group about almost 10 years ago is the, the identification that C4D is not a is not a stable marker, which means that there are people who move from C4D negative to C4D positive, back to C4D negative, et cetera. Um, so what we did in our study was we looked at C4D negative patients who never had any evidence of C4D positivity. When you look at the number of days until the biopsy that defined the AMR, you see that C4D positive AMR gets diagnosed very early. C4D negative AMR gets diagnosed somewhat later. And if you look at the impact of these, C4D negative AMR does not have as much of an impact as C4D positive AMR, but when we compare them to matched controls, we see that there's still risk associated with C4D negative AMR, not as much risk as with C4D positive AMR, but still a risk that is there and that is statistically significant. And when we quantify this in an adjusted regression model, we can say that C4D negative AMR is associated with two and a half times risk of graft loss. C4D positive AMR is associated with 3.7 fold higher risk of graft loss. So C4D negative AMR, definitely something to look out for, definitely something that we know is risky and something that we need to be treating. The most frustrating part of AMR today, and I might say even the most frustrating part of kidney transplantation today is late antibody-mediated rejection. And the late AMR can come from two different sources. It can come from preformed antibody, although in general, the early AMRs come from preformed antibody, and it can also come from de novo donor-specific antibody, meaning antibodies that have arisen late after the transplant that are now causing trouble for the allograft. And the early reports of this came from Phil Halloran and the, uh, the Canadian group in uh, collaboration with the French group. And they looked at AMR from de novo donor-specific antibodies and compared that to pre-existing donor-specific antibodies. And I will make the note that it is felt today that most de novo DSA comes from medication non-adherence, meaning that we do a very good job of blocking the immune system when patients take their immunosuppression, but patients will not take it here and there. They'll miss one pill here, miss one pill there, et cetera. And that causes not allograft loss necessarily, but the development of de novo donor-specific antibodies, which then later come to affect the allograft. And so you see pre-existing donor-specific antibody is an early problem. De novo donor-specific antibody is a late AMR problem. What's worse though is that pre-existing donor-specific antibody affects the allograft, but de novo donor-specific antibody affects the allograft even more. So the worst thing that can happen to an allograft is de novo DSA with the late AMR. And in our clinical experience, many of these allografts are lost and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it except try to prevent the long-term, the late AMR from occurring, which, is, which means try to prevent the de novo DSA from occurring, which means better medication adherence. And you can see here that the de novo DSA had two times the risk of allograft loss compared to pre-existing DSA. So this is a very harmful donor-specific antibody. And what is felt to happen is that the DSA causes endothelial cell activation, complement activation, recruitment of lymphocytes, and the coagulation cascade. This leads to late 
antibody-mediated processes of cap capillaritis, glomerulitis, et cetera, leading to a transplant glomerulopathy, remodeling of the basement membrane, expansion of the mesangial matrix, obliteration of capillaries, effacement of the foot processes to then reduced allograft function, proteinuria, and ultimately allograft loss. So we need to stop this, and the cascade starts at the development of, dono of donor-specific antibody. So I've gone through the entire spectrum of AMR with you from subclinical to severe early to clinical and to late AMR. What wisdom can we gather from this? One, very importantly, that severe AMR is clinically devastating and requires an aggressive clinical response with splenectomy or eculizumab or splenic irradiation. Remember, this is the day seven B cell memory response that is very aggressive and plasmapheresis is not enough to compete with a very aggressive B cell compartment um, creating new antibody. Clinical AMR is associated with about five times the risk of allograft loss, but this depends on the donor type. C4D negative and positive AMR, patients are phenotypically similar, but the C4D positive occurs more frequently and has a more aggressive clinical presentation. C4D negative is recognized later, less likely to have as much of a clinical presentation of the C4D positive. They both have worse graft survival compared to their match recipients. Um, and the C4D negative needs to be treated just like C4D positive needs to be treated. Late AMR is the most challenging and is usually associated with de novo donor specific antibody. Um, and the outcomes with AMR caused by de novo do donor specific antibody are horrible. They're worse than that from pre existing um, donor specific antibody. And our ability to treat this is very, very limited. Um, so I will thank you at this point. Um, we, we do have time for questions. Not We broke up the half an hour, so we have, again, probably 10 minutes for questions. And then um, after your break, you'll hear from my colleague, uh, Dr. Vincenti. So thank you. Thank you very much. Very challenging. So we go again alphabetical. Aman first. Any question from our audience here in Amman? Dr. Radi. Mike. Thank you, Professor Dore. Uh, uh, I would like to ask about the C1Q deposits in the allograft in relation to AMR, uh, similar to the C4D with regard to prognosis and uh, diagnosis. Yeah, that's a very good question and has somewhat become religion in transplantation where some HLA labs are very insistent that um, this deposition makes all of the difference between analyzing, um, between understanding whether um, there is risk of the antibodies or not. And some labs do not believe in uh, the C1Q assay at all. I think that at this point, um, there is some evidence that this is clinically meaningful above and beyond what already measures we have in terms of antibody strength, but there is not enough evidence that I would say that every uh, HLA lab should be doing um, C1Q today. Uh, Professor Riyad. Thank you very much really for this nice talk. I'd like to read just one comment. In the last 20 years, I'll say over took care of more than 1,000 kidney transplant locally in my center. I'll tell you, I did not really lose any single kidney due to acute allograft antibody-mediated rejection. 
Sure, we have our patient only highly selected patients, living related kidney transplant, uh, zero mismatch, possibly three out of six. And the only time we use just simple ATG, antithymic globulin, and we have excellent result. No kidney has been lost at all. Thank you. Yeah, and that's, um, it's a very great point that when we do compatible live donor transplants, as you saw, even in our population, the risk of AMR was only 0.7%, so much less than 1% risk of AMR. And if you are clinically experienced and you detect the AMR, the AMR is treatable. When you start to get into trouble with AMR is when, with early AMR is when you have pre-existing donor-specific antibody. So if you're transplanting people either across a, a known HLA incompatibility or if there is a low-risk HLA incompatibility that you still think the transplant is, uh, is important to do, that's when you start to really get high rates of AMR and the danger associated with AMR. But I also agree that when a center has experience in detecting early rejections and in treating early rejections, those will have less impact on the allograft than, when, than in centers where there is less experience in treating them. Any comments or questions from Baghdad? Questions from Beirut? Yes, we have two questions. Yes, please. Okay, thank you for your uh, interesting lecture. I would ask if uh, how how you manage patients with subclinical AMR, especially uh, 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 single uh, uh, a mom uh, a, a lady who who wants to get pregnant. And the uh, baseline serum creatinine is 1.4, 1.5 milligram per deciliter. And she was asking for, uh, uh, for uh, my help if she, get, if, she, if she may get pregnant. And we did kidney biopsy, and we saw that she has subclinical uh, AMR. So how you manage these patients? Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. And some of it depends on the timeline of the subclinical AMR. So, for example, if we transplanted somebody where we know there's some pre-existing antibody, we do a biopsy two weeks after the transplant, and we see subclinical AMR, this is something we're going to treat aggressively. And since we can't watch the creatinine or the urine output, then we will repeat the biopsy after treatment, after a certain amount of treatment, to make sure that um, we stopped that early process. Because a lot of the early subclinical AMR will become clinical if left untreated. Late subclinical AMR, so let's say we just happen to do a biopsy two years down the road because we do protocol biopsies and we find late subclinical AMR, this is very challenging. This is almost as challenging as knowing what to do for late clinical AMR, almost nothing of which seems to work. Our general philosophy has been, if we find a subclinical AMR on a biopsy, whenever the biopsy was performed, try to treat this. So do some plasmapheresis, maybe give one dose of rituximab, try to treat this, hoping that whatever is going on is somewhat acute and we can stop this cascade. And then repeat the biopsy and see if we've been successful. But if we have not been successful and we still see a subclinical process and we don't really have a good sense of how to treat this late, then I think you just have to very carefully monitor the patient. So nobody really has a good answer for whether you need to treat a subclinical AMR that shows up late and how you would treat that and how you would monitor your treatment. I'm, I'm giving you a, a pretty conservative view for what we do, but that's not necessarily the right answer. Nobody has ever looked at this scientifically. I think we have another question from Beirut. Dori Segev, this is Sharbel, your previous fellow. <laughs> just, thanks for these amazing talks. I came just to listen to it. And hopefully next time we'll have you physically in Beirut. It's amazing, amazing weather. 
amazing time, nicer than Baltimore. Especially <laughs> with your uh, with your Lebanese jeans, you have to come once. Can you see me now? Uh, yeah, I can see you. Okay, good. <laughs> we'll see you soon. I'll text you tonight. I think we'll we'll move. Uh, any question from Damascus? Uh, so my question is uh, regarding the poorly compliant adolescent kidney transplant recipients, where we know that up to 30% probably of this age group transplant recipient uh, 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 the, uh, of graft loss may be due to poor compliance, which usually went undiagnosed and ultimate diagnosis is uh, chronic rejection. But we, we do know that many of them, they are poorly compliant or poorly adherent to their medication. The question is how to identify those patients in order to prevent or to early diagnose their uh, subclinical, let's say, or late AMR. Uh, is it only uh, by doing more frequently uh, uh, DSA monitoring or any, any other suggestion? Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And as you say, the adolescent population is extremely frustrating. And actually, when we studied this, more than 40% of allografts that are functioning at the age of 17 are lost by the age of 25. So this is an incredibly high risk group. Some people have advocated for protocol biopsies in this group, although that's very challenging and is not particularly safe for the allograft. There are new technologies for measuring um, medication adherence where, you know, every time they open the bottle, there is a record that is sent to the, uh, to the um, transplant center to show that they've taken a particular medication. And there, are, there have been centers that use these technologies to identify patients that are at risk. Um, you can also do more frequent uh, immunosuppression monitoring, like tacrolimus level monitoring and things like that. Um, anything you can use to, to warn you that a patient is not taking their medications as they are supposed to will probably then lead you to a better surveillance for a subclinical process. The problem is that even if you detect a subclinical AMR three years after a kidney transplant in an adolescent, there's not much you can do about that immunologically. You really have to address the root cause, which is the fact that they're non-adherent with their medications. And so I think we, we as transplant people like to look at the immunology, like to look at what's going on physiologically. We really need to collaborate with our, our colleagues in health behavior to create health behavior intervention programs that help adolescents take their medications, understand the importance of taking their medications, and help us do surveillance of their medication adherence. Any questions from Palestine? Uh, you talked about splenectomy and severe clinical AMR. My question is, at what time the splenectomy should be done to be benefit? I mean, within hours, within days. Thank you. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> I think when you are comfortable that you have a diagnosis of severe accelerated early AMR, when you've made that diagnosis, a splenectomy should be done immediately because the, the, the use of plasmapheresis will not be successful in those cases. Now, the question is, when are you comfortable that you have a diagnosis of severe early accelerated antibody-mediated rejection? And usually that's after a day or two of trying to figure out what is going on with the allograft, making sure there is not a thrombotic cause from this, et cetera. So in general, I think in the setting where we know there are pre-existing donor-specific antibodies, so we have, 
crossed a repeat mismatch. We have crossed a known HLA incompatibility. We know there are memory cells there and we're afraid that the memory cells have become activated. And it's about five to seven days after the transplant. And we see a dramatic drop in the urine output and we see a dramatic rise in the donor specific antibody. I think in those settings, if you're going to choose splenectomy as your approach, you can even perform the biopsy, immediately get the biopsy results and immediately perform the splenectomy on that patient. Usually you'll have one or two days of trying plasmapheresis as you were trying to diagnose that. But again, when we have waited, we have regretted waiting because it's made it more difficult for the allograft to, uh, to recover. Remember that this is a relatively rare clinical scenario, but after you've seen it a few times, you will recognize the patterns that the patients, uh, that, that the patients follow. Thank you very much. I think we have to stop here. Uh, Professor Dori, we enjoyed very much your presence with us. We enjoyed your talks and we hope to see you again in another webinar in the future, if the budget of Novartis allows, of course. Now, uh, dear colleagues from the Levant, uh, thank you very much. We'll, we'll have a coffee break for 30 minutes and then we'll, we'll come back for two talks presented by Professor Flavio Vincenti. The first talk will be chaired by uh, Dr. <coughs> Dania Shlale from Beirut, and the second talk will be, will be chaired by Dr. Zahbal Malah from Baghdad. Okay, good evening. Uh, I'm Dania Shlale, a nephrologist in Beirut, and I would like to thank Novartis for organizing this webinar. We had a great uh, session, interactive session. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Flavio Vincenti, who, is, who received his medical degree from uh, St. Joseph University in Beirut, and then had his uh, American Board of Nephrology in, uh, in the state. And then he, he, Dr. Vincenti is a kidney and pancreas transplant specialist and is clinical professor of medicine and surgery in the University of California, San Francisco. He is a member of several international societies of nephrology and transplantation. He had several articles. He wrote several articles. He is very well known in the nephrology community. And he, 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 he was a major uh, investigator in several important studies in the kidney uh, transplantation field. So it will be a great pleasure to hear what he's going to uh, learn us today about kidney transplantation. Thank you, Dr. Vicenti. Thank you, and it's a pleasure uh, uh, to join you from San Francisco, and welcome back to the Kidney Disease Workshop. Uh, I'll be presenting this morning uh, or this evening for you two talks, uh, and following my presentation, hopefully we'll have plenty of time and opportunity for you to ask uh, questions. As my colleague Dr. Segev mentioned, the goal of this program is to educate nephrologists and other healthcare professionals who manage patients with kidney disease or uh, pre and post transplant. And uh, the next slide, uh, you can see our uh, learning uh, objectives uh, and uh, the fact that this is a CME uh, activity uh, which is brought to you today by the Advancing Knowledge in Healthcare and Kikako America International. And as you heard, supported by an educational grant from uh, Novartis. And uh, so the first talk uh, is all about immunosuppression. And the title is How to Optimize Current Immunosuppression Regimens, uh, Induction, CNI Minimization, Steroid Sparing, mTOR inhibitors, so we're going to discuss it all, and I'll give you an update as to where all these drugs and these regimens stand nowadays. Uh, so this is a slide that shows you the um, current use of immunosuppression. Uh, as you can see now, most uh, centers and most transplant recipients are on tacrolimus rather than on cyclosporin, maybe ten, less than 10% are on cyclosporin, especially in the United States. For antiproliferative, uh, there is very little use of azathioprine. Most patients are on um, 
uh, microphenolate mofetil. Uh, the mTOR inhibitors, when they introduced in the late 90s, there was a lot of excitement about them, and they started to be used quite a bit. Uh, but then uh, people realize that uh, it may not be easy to use them. They have some side effects. So the use has decreased quite a bit. Although, as I'll discuss later, we may see a revival of the mTOR. Uh, the corticosteroids used to be that everybody was on corticosteroids, uh, but uh, almost half of the patients now are withdrawn from steroids. Is this a good maneuver? I will discuss that. Now, in terms of induction therapy, uh, more and more patients are placed on uh, thymoglobulin. Uh, the percentage of patients using anti-IL-2 antibodies like basiliximab or Similic has decreased. And there is a group of patients, maybe 20%, that are transplanted without induction. And personally, I'm not in favor of that. And I'll, I'll come back to that. So basically, if we want to say what is the gold standard for transplant in terms of use, it's a combination of tacrolimus, mycophenolic acid, and steroids, plus or minus steroids. And then patients can be either on rabbit ATG, thymoglobulin, or Fresenius uh, ATG, or the anti-IL-2 antibodies. And the only one that's on the market is, of course, basiliximab. The reason to combine these medications is to have a regimen which is more efficacious, uh, more immunological targets, and uh, by giving multiple drugs, we can reduce each one to minimize toxicities. And I think this is a telescope view of immunosuppression and outcome. And of course, from the 1960s, as you can see, uh, one-year graft survival has improved a lot. So nowadays we expect both in uh, kidneys from deceased donor and living donor, graft survival to be over 90% and over 95% at one year in living donors, uh, in patients who get kidneys from living donors. And rejection rate nowadays is hovering around 10% with all the introduction of the drugs from the late 1990s and early uh, 21st century. However, all these are early results. And this is a study which uh, is of uh, great interest called Long-Term Renal Allograft Survival in the United States. This is uh, based on UNOS data. And here what we see that the attrition rate, this is both holds true for uh, standard criteria donors, deceased donors, and living donors, that the one-year graft loss with the introduction of all the new drugs over the past uh, 20 years has decreased the one-year loss quite a bit so that the one-year loss now of graft hovers between 5 to 7 percent. On the other hand, the yearly attrition rate uh, beyond the one year, one to three years, three to five here in green, and five to ten has not changed a whole lot. So we have improved a lot the first year, but the yearly loss of graft long term, as you can see here in red, has remained pretty stable. So uh, we have to improve long term outcome. And uh, this slide shows the uh, factors that influence selection of therapies. Uh, of course, we base them on, on outcome data from randomized controlled trial. trials. We look at immunologic risk. Is this patient highly sensitized? Do they need uh, more intense immunosuppression? We look at comorbidities and prior immunosuppression burden. And of course, you know, some patients may be more susceptible to toxicities from calcineurin inhibitors and steroids. And this is just a complicated slide, but in fact, it just shows the, uh, uh, the, the various uh, targets of our immunosuppressive drugs nowadays. Uh, as you know, uh, the T cell to become activated requires two signal. Signal one is when the allopeptide is presented to the T cells. They, but this is not enough to activate the T cell. The T cell requires a second signal, and this is called the co-stimulatory signal. CD28 binds to two ligands, CD80 and 86, on the antigen-presenting cells. And so when the T cell sees antigen in the context of co-stimulation, it gets activated. Uh, downstream signaling read, uh, leads to transcription factor uh, translocating to the nucleus, binding to the DNA, and then starting transcription uh, or, and translation 
of cytokine like IL-2, then IL-2 binds to its receptor and the downstream uh, signaling activates the mTOR pathway and then that leads to uh, initiation of the cell cycle, incorporation of uh, nucleotide synthesis and, uh, and uh, of course, cell proliferation follows thereafter. And we have drugs that basically uh, inter interact and inhibit uh, from signal one to signal two to the calcineurin inhibitors uh, with, the, with the inhibition of uh, uh, NFAT and of course uh, the mTOR inhibitors and the anti-metabolites. So uh, the Kedigo group, when uh, we got together to uh, uh, put together the recommendation for transplantation, in terms of induction, we recommended that uh, the anti-L2 antibody be first line induction therapy, uh, but we suggested that uh, the use of uh, uh, anti-lymphocyte depleting agent is better in high immunologic uh, risk patients and that these patients should be uh, depleted with uh, uh, thymoglobulin or whatever else uh, antibody, depleting antibody is available in, in the region. Uh, now, uh, of course, when you assess outcomes with induction therapy, uh, there are limitation of uh, clinical trials that compare, frankly, one to the other. I think uh, uh, the one thing that recently happened is that thymoglobulin was not approved by the FDA for induction therapy. It was approved only for treatment of rejection. And just recently, the FDA approved it for induction therapy. Uh, some centers in the United States use alemtuzumab campus, which produces a very severe and prolonged depletion of T and B cells. And I think it's going to be on its way out. And it's not approved for use in transplantation anyway. So the question here, if you have a, a high-risk patient, which is better to use, basiliximab or ATG? And this is the one study by uh, uh, Dr. Brennan, published in New England Journal, compared the, these two inductions uh, in patients that are at high risk for rejection. And as you can see, the rejection rate with basiliximab, 25%, and it was significantly lower with ATG. So that now uh, uh, this study serves as a guide that if you have a high risk, immunologic high risk patients, you're, you're better off using uh, thymoglobulin. Now there is a recent uh, mini review in the American Journal of Transplantation that asks the question, induction therapy for kidney transplant recipients, do we still need the anti-L2 receptor monoclonal antibodies? So the question was here, why use at all anti-L2 and why just not use thymoglobulins since we know it's more, it's more powerful. And uh, from the review of the literature, they concluded with triple maintenance therapy, the addition of induction, primarily with the anti-L2 antibodies, may achieve an absolute risk reduction for acute rejection of only one to 4% in standard risk patients without improving graft or patient survival. So I don't disagree with this. I disagree with the conclusion. Uh, I think uh, in the, the one thing about the anti-L2 antibodies like basiliximab, it is that they are the only group of agents as a, in the immunosuppression field that gives you something more immunosuppression without an increase in uh, over immunosuppression such as opportunistic infection or cancers like PTLD. Uh, so you're getting something without paying any penalty. Although their effect is mild, they don't change outcome. Uh, they do reduce rejection rate by a few percentage points. But what's important to realize is that when you give the anti-L2 antibodies to patients, you have time slowly to increase the targets of tacrolimus. If the patient has poor bioavailability of mycophenolate, mofetil, uh, you are not putting the patient at greater risk of rejection. So I think it is a mistake to completely avoid induction for low immunologic risk patients, as well as I think it is a mistake to over immunosuppress them and give them thymoglobulin. So at UCSF, our center, 
we still uh, stratify patients, low immunologic risk, they get anti-L2, high immunologic risk, they are treated with thymoglobulin in order to deplete them. Uh, in terms of the initial immunosuppressive regimen, again, the KEDICO uh, guidelines suggest that patients uh, uh, be started on CNI and antiproliferative with corticosteroids or later on without corticosteroids, that tacrolimus be the treatment, the CNI of choice, and mycophenolate mofetil, the antiproliferative of choice. They also recommend that mTOR are used uh, they should be started after the patient has had the transplant so as not uh, uh, induce uh, problems with surgical wound healing and improving renal function early on. Sometimes mTOR inhibitors uh, can delay the recovery of patients who are in ATN. So over the years, because of this fear of nephrotoxicity of the CNI, there have been several studies uh, to induce CNI minimization, such as in the Symphony trial. CNI elimination, meaning starting patient on CNI and then stopping CNI, <coughs> or complete CNI av avoidance, and these are two studies, Symphony and Orion. I'm gonna go over a few very quickly. So the Symphony trial uh, suggested that a protocol with low-dose tacrolimus uh, and induction with anti-L2. Uh, these are again standard uh, uh, risk patients, uh, produce the best result, the lowest rejection rate. And so in this study, they suggested that standard cyclosporin uh, as well as low cyclosporin uh, did not produce as good results as treating patients with low dose stack. Uh, and of course, the worst group was patients treated with a CNI-free regimen with serolimus and MMF. Ha however, here, the low-dose TAC actually ended up by being standard TAC. So for example, at 12 months, the average uh, uh, target was 6.4 nanogram, and at 36 months in the, uh, in the Symphony trial, the target was the same, about 6.5. So these are what we call today uh, uh, standard level of tacrolimus. And so these are certainly not low doses of uh, tacrolimus. Uh, there are some protocols now, and certainly at our center beyond the year, we don't like patients to be much higher than five nanogram per ml, uh, provided they are low immunologic risk. And number two, they have had no rejection. This is a study that uh, tried to see what is the role of mTOR inhibitor. Uh, and this was, study was performed with serolimus. So patients were uh, uh, stratified to three treatment groups, tacrolimus and, uh, and serolimus. And at 30 weeks, tacrolimus was eliminated. Uh, group two was tacrolimus avoidance. So these patients were treated with serolimus and MMF. And the third group was standard, tacrolimus MMF. So this study was stopped because the group that were on serolimus MMF had high rejection rate, 32%. And so uh, the study was uh, terminated. Uh, and the lowest rejection rate as expected was a tacrolimus MMF with a rejection rate of 8%. However, the GFR of all the groups, just going back, was not different at one year. And so despite all these maneuvers, uh, the renal function was similar in the three groups. You know, but clearly a serolimus MMF or an mTOR MMF combination without CNI from the beginning is not advisable these days. And these are uh, studies that converted patients from tacrolimus to mTOR inhibitors, are they either serolimus or everolimus. And this conversion occurred uh, as early as two months or as late as 120 months. And uh, with a you know, follow-up of 12 months to 36 months in the studies. As you can see, the uh, um, GFR showed in some studies some modest improvement, 3.6 CR ML up to 8 ML. Uh, but in almost all the studies, there was slightly higher uh, rejection rate. And so it is a risk when you convert patients uh, from uh, CNI to mTOR, uh, 
of having a rejection. I think this risk, of course, can be minimized, uh, and I'll come back th to that later on. Now, can you withdraw uh, tacrolimus in patients who are doing great? This is a very nice study. This is organized and supported by the NIH called Adverse Outcome of Tacrolimus Withdrawal in Immune Quiescent Kidney Transplant Recipients. So in this study, they took patients who had the kidney from a living donor, had excellent immunosuppression, including uh, thymoglobulin, tacrolimus, MMF, and steroids. At six months, these patients had a biopsy that looked normal and had no rejection, had no DSA, and then they withdrew tacrolimus from them. And the study was terminated because already several patients, 4 of 14 had acute rejection and 5 of 14 developed donor-specific antibodies. So uh, basically, it is not safe to do this maneuver. So past performance does not predict future results, meaning just because you take a patient who's done great on certain immunosuppression, if you withdraw drugs, it's a completely new ball game, and therefore uh, you have to assess the risk going forward. That's why in the future, uh, we need biomarkers to predict the future rather than looking back and saying because of the past was smooth, the future is going to be okay if we withdraw drugs. Uh, now, I want to make a, a, a couple of very quick comments on once a day tacrolimus because sometimes you may be faced with that. There are two uh, that are available. Uh, tacrolimus uh, modified release. Uh, I think in outside the United States, it's called Advograft. In, in the United States, it's Astograft. And then the, uh, 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 an, another drug, the LCP-TAC, uh, which uh, I think it's um, uh, outside the United States, uh, it's called Inversus. So uh, uh, the advantage of the once a day that the patient can take both doses of tacrolimus in the morning, uh, and then the four, uh, they don't have to worry about uh, losing, uh, forgetting taking the evening dose. Uh, there are some studies that shows that there is a very high, not very high, but a high, higher incidence of uh, non-adherence with the evening drugs than the morning one. Now, uh, these two are pretty comparable, except that I think the LCP has a nicer pharmacokinetic profile. Uh, this is the pharmacokinetic profile of tacrolimus. You, when the patient takes tacrolimus at two hours, they have a big peak and then slowly goes down to a trough level. Uh, the, the, uh, as the advograft from uh, Astellas, it has almost a similar peak, and then the trough level goes below tacrolimus. On the other hand, uh, the inverses, and this is a drug from Beloxys, has a, 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 a gentler and broader shoulder, and the trough level are similar to, uh, uh, to tacrolimus. So of the two, I don't know now if it makes any difference in terms of toxicity or, or otherwise, but of the two the once a day drugs, the LCP appears at least on the pharmacokinetic basis to have a, uh, an advantage. Now, uh, I want to go back to the mTOR because as I said, the mTOR may be finding a revival. So of course the mTOR are, are immunosuppressive drugs, but they are the only class of immunosuppression that have other effects that could be very beneficial. Anti-tumor effect, antigenesis, they block viral replication. Uh, cardiovascularly also, they have some very interesting effect. And of course, they decrease and they do not promote uh, interstitial uh, fibrosis. So uh, this is a, um, a pathway of mTOR and mTOR inhibition. Uh, so when there is a growth factor or cytokines bind to the receptor, the intracellular signaling is mediated by two kinases, PI3K and uh, AKT. These activate and phosphorylate the mTOR complex and the mTOR complex is made up of five proteins. Uh, and this is a uh, complex, basically, that leads to activation of uh, two molecules, uh, S6 kinase and 4E binding protein. And these are uh, critical to initiate translation and protein synthesis uh, 
for cell replication, uh, important in metabolism and nutrition and angiogenesis. And so uh, the mTOR inhibitors, both Seralimus and Everolimus, bind to the FK binding protein and then uh, are able to effectively uh, inhibit the mTOR complex and therefore block uh, the downstream signaling and they can, and they of course block protein synthesis, arrest the cell cycles and so on. Now, what is very interesting and what we have found more uh, uh, very relevant to transplantation is that uh, DNA-based viruses like CMV and BK actually can take over the machinery of the mTOR and they can activate the mTOR complex because viruses require uh, protein synthesis for the replication and therefore uh, they can directly activate uh, PI3K and AKT. And that's one of the reasons why the mTOR inhibitors uh, block viral replication. So that these are the only immunosuppressive agents that produce immunosuppression and at the same time uh, block uh, viruses. And uh, the reason for that is that uh, they block, they take over of the mTOR machinery in the cell by CMV and that MBK. And in many studies uh, uh, that have, in, where patients were treated with the mTOR inhibitors, uh, when there was analysis of CMV infection and BK, uh, there was a either a significant reduction or a trend toward reduced infection with uh, CMV and NBK. And so this is a, a potential advantage of uh, the mTOR inhibitor. Another interesting thing about the mTOR complex is that uh, very surprisingly, so when, when people get an infection, uh, the way that they defend themselves against infection is that, uh, and especially viral infection, uh, they expand uh, the effector CD8 cells to combat the infection. As soon as the infection abates, there is a contraction of these cells. And few of the effector CD8 cells then uh, are, uh, uh, differentiate into memory cells and therefore they protect the uh, host from future uh, uh, viral infection. Now, the mTOR plays an important role in this process, but what has been uh, quite interesting and surprising that if you inhibit mTOR complex one with, let's say, Everolimus or Seralimus, in fact, what happens, you increase the percentage of cells uh, that become memory, and therefore, actually, you strengthen the memory response to infection rather than weaken it. So here you have an a, a immunosuppressive agent that actually potentiate the, viral, the host antiviral responses. Uh, and so it, it is um, a surprising finding and one that you know, can account for finding less infection in patients treated with mTOR inhibitors. So uh, this is one of, there is a large study that's going to be reported at ESAT called the TRANSFORM that uh, shows that you can use very low doses of tacrolimus with mTOR, with everolimus. This is a previous study uh, that shows what you can do with, if you use the, uh, everolimus in this case. So in this study, patients were randomized to tacrolimus either uh, standard levels or uh, target levels, four to seven, or uh, uh, Everolimus and treating patients at the beginning with a standard levels, four to seven, but after three months dropping the dose of, uh, or sorry, dropping the target level of Tacrolimus to very low levels, 1.5 to three. So it's 1.5 to three versus four to seven. Anyway, to make a long short, uh, story sh uh, short, uh, beyond three months when the two groups have either higher or very low uh, tacrolimus uh, uh, level target levels, that the rejection rate are similar. At the beginning, they are different, uh, although they are on the same regimen. 
but long term they have the same rejection rate. And in fact, the group that has the target 1.5 to 3 nanogram ml of tacrolimus have few ml of GFR better than those who have higher rates, higher target levels of tacrolimus. So what is the role of mTOR inhibitors right now? One, you can minimize the CNI dosage. I think this study and the transform trial will show that. Number two, um, if you need to convert patients at six months for toxicity or other reasons, uh, the GFR should be equal or greater than 40 ml. Uh, the patient should have low levels of proteinuria. Uh, and uh, the transition, the conversion should be gradual. You cannot stop CNI and start mTOR. If you do it over a month, the risk of rejection is decreased and you have to make sure that the patient has not had previous rejection. The best reason to convert is that the patient who has, has had a malignancy pre-transplant or has developed skin cancer. And I think in those cases, conversion is very beneficial. So I would like to say a few words about biomarkers and Belatacep. Uh, uh, in uh, 2016, we published the seven-year long-term follow-up of patients treated with Belatacep. And as you know, Belatacep is a fusion receptor protein that blocks the co-stimulatory signal by binding to CD8086. Uh, and in this study, patients were randomized to a more intense regimen of Bella, a lower intense regimen of Belatacep versus cyclosporin. And uh, these two, of course, the Belatacep groups were CNI free versus cyclosporin. Uh, and in this uh, figure shows that patients that were on Belatacep had significantly better outcome in terms of graft survival and patient uh, survival as compared to patients treated with cyclosporin. Their GFR was significantly and throughout the seven years higher than patient treated with cyclosporin. And one of interesting thing is that patient treated with belatacep had lower numbers of donor-specific antibodies. So less frequency of DSA as compared to patient with cyclosporin. However, patients treated with belatacep early on tended to have more cellular rejection. They were mostly reversible rejection, but that's a risk with belatacep. So the question is how in the future can we improve on belatacep? How can we improve in our care? And the answer may be with biomarkers. And I want to talk to you briefly about one biomarker, which will be uh, available soon, and that's called KSORT. And this is a PCR test of 17 uh, genes uh, that measure immune activation in the blood. And so uh, the 17, uh, we, we obtained blood from the patient. Uh, in the 17 genes, they, their expression is measured and then analyzed by 13 models. Uh, each one uh, contains 12 of say, 17 genes at random. Each model then scores uh, the activation and either plus one, meaning consistent with acute rejection or minus one. So uh, if your test shows uh, plus nine to plus 13, it means the patient is at high risk of rejection. If it's minus nine to minus 13, low risk and in between is indetermined. And uh, this test has shown to have a high predictive value for rejection, 83% and a high, very high negative predictive value. In other words, if you have a patient to, who, who the creatin that's slightly up and you don't know is it rejection or CNI toxicity, if the case sort is negative, uh, the likelihood is 97% that the patient does not have a rejection. And therefore, occasionally you could, one could use it instead of doing a kidney biopsy. And this is again, as a multi-center trial that utilized the test to show that in fact it is both specific and sensitive. And one of the interesting thing, and this has to be proven further, is that at the time of rejection, as I said, there is a very high likelihood that the test is positive, but the, the test can turn positive uh, as early as four months before a rejection episode, because in fact, it's measuring immune activation in the blood. And therefore, in the future, we may be able to use this test uh, to monitor whether our immunosuppression is adequate. 
Now, should you keep patients on steroid or should you withdraw them? I have a whole talk about that and I call it an inconvenient truth. And the inconvenient truth is that steroid sparing, withdrawing patients from steroids, may not benefit the recipients. Now, steroids, of course, are important. They have lots of uh, important effects on the immune system. Their steroids are also bad. We know the cosmetic effect, the skeletal effect, uh, the eye complications, the metabolic, more, more chole higher cholesterol levels, higher uh, incidence of diabetes. In children, of course, there is growth retardation. Uh, the, the dark side of withdrawing steroids there is a higher incidence of acute rejection, more leukopenia, uh, and the long-term outcome is really not clear. They, I have participated in several steroid withdrawal studies, uh, and uh, however, the best steroid withdrawal study is the one that Dr. Woodell has published many years ago, and this was a prospective randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial uh, comparing early steroid withdrawal at day seven versus maintenance steroids. Uh, and the good thing about the study, it was double blind and for five years. So the patients were randomized to the two groups. Uh, they were all induced with either thymo or IL-2 and tacrolimus and MMF. Uh, patients were either withdrawn from steroid at seven days or were continued on steroid. Now, the only problem I have with this study is that the patients on steroids stayed on relatively higher dose steroids for almost 90 days, like close to 10 milligrams. At UCSF now, by day 29 and sometimes by day 21, we have patients down to five milligrams of prednisone. And that's why I think if you drop the prednisone very quickly, uh, you really do not see their toxicities. Anyway, in this study, there was no difference between the group in graft survival, uh, there were, though, more rejection in patients who had corticosteroid withdrawal, 20% versus 12% in those who stayed on steroids. Uh, there, this is biopsy-confirmed rejection over five years, 27% in steroid withdrawal versus 17 in those who stayed on steroids. Uh, and then those patients uh, who had biopsy long-term for uh, arising creatine had more chronic allograft nephropathy if they had steroid withdrawal as compared to steroids. Now, what's interesting is that uh, no, that was no different. Uh, so hyperglycemia did not make a difference whether you were steroids or off steroids. Hypertension, no difference. Hyperlipidemia, no difference. Weight, no difference. So we can't say, oh, people get obese because of, ste of the steroids. There were no difference. Uh, the only difference was in, in avascular necrosis and fracture. Uh, higher in patients on steroids as compared to those not steroids. However, as I said, uh, the patients on steroids were treated with an old type protocol where you keep patients on 10 milligrams for a long period of time. At UCSF, where we dropped the dose of steroids to five milligram by three or maximum four weeks, I have not seen a case of avascular necrosis for years. And therefore, even the bone complications are can be avoided with lowering steroids right away. I think the only group that benefits from steroid withdrawal are children. And so those are particular cases. Uh, but I think in general, the approach of withdrawing steroids, in my opinion, doesn't give you much benefit and produces potentially more side effects. Uh, so in conclusion, currently individualizing immunosuppression therapy is important, improving outcome after transplantation and optimizing short-term and long-term outcome with no toxicity may require the application of precision medicine. This is the next step, not individualized medicine, precision medicine, where you use uh, molecular markers and biomarkers uh, to, uh, to target, to individualize the immunosuppression of the patient. So uh, this is the end of the first talk, and let me see if I can move to the second one. As I said, uh, we will have um, uh, discussion, uh, questions uh, at the end. Let me see if I can, uh, I need to, let me see. I, I need to go to the second talk if I can manage this. If I uh, may interrupt you, uh, at the bottom of your screen, uh, using the same uh, share screen 
Oh, okay. I go to the share. Okay, let me see. I go to the share screen. Is that the one? Oh, okay. This is. I have the second talk then. And then you need. Yeah, you need to find the uh, find the PowerPoint. There we go. There you are. So we've gone through these uh, preliminary slides before, and we can go. Okay. So. Let me talk, give you a brief summary of delay graph function. Uh, Dr. Vincenzi, I'm not sure if, uh, are we going right into the talk or are we doing a brief Q&A session? Uh, I thought uh, the question and answer was at the end for both. Um, I'm not uh, sure. But if you prefer to ask me questions now, I'm, I'm okay on this I, first talk. I personally am not sure. As, as far as I know, the, uh, the gentleman in Beirut uh, was directing any sort of uh, Q&A. So. Okay, that's fine. Go ahead, ask me questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Vincenti, for this overview of immunosuppressive treatments. Before moving to the questions, we have an announcement, please, to all the attendees in the countries, please make sure you give your email address to the organizers, because we are going to receive a link to be able to look again at the uh, presentations or download them. Thank you if you do it. And now we can move to the questions. Uh, we have a question from Beirut, Dr. Azar. Good evening. Do we have any data about the use of mTOR inhibitors post PTLD? Uh, and do you feel using uh, Everolimus in young patients, especially uh, young males? And those are two questions. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, uh, I think one has to be careful with young males uh, because uh, the effect on, uh, you know, sperm count. So that that may be uh, something that needs to potentially be monitored. And even young, young, even average males have to be told about that potential issue. With PTLD, it appears that the use of mTOR may be beneficial. So uh, at our center, if we have a patient with PTLD and they fulfill the criteria, the GFR is over 40, they have no proteinuria, we would do one or two things. Uh, uh, we would uh, either uh, convert them completely to mTOR or uh, um, lower the CNI and put them, lower the CNI targets very dramatically and uh, stop MMF and and place them on mTOR. Um, because early on, especially the first year, many of the PTLD are EBV driven. And again, um, uh, the mTOR are very powerful inhibitor of viral replication. That there is an added benefit of patients being on mTOR. Now, uh, the PTLD long term are usually EBV independent, uh, in the, the PTLD long term are EBV independent, and those are more treated like the heme oncology uh, uh, with the chemotherapy and, of course, also rituximab if they're CD20 positive. So in, in, in those patients, I'm not totally clear how, how much benefit you get from mTOR inhibitors, but in general, I think uh, with tumors, uh, the preferred agent is the is the mTOR and we always we try uh, frequently uh, if the patient tolerates it and they fulfill the criteria for conversion then we convert them to mTOR I think we have another question from Beirut Dr. Abu uh, thanks for your talk uh, I wonder what is the best maintenance immunosuppression in patients who are 6-HLA match? Uh, well, I, you know, I think patients who are HLA identical are immunologically privileged. And so while I would still maintain them on triple therapy, these are the one group of patients where I think you can withdraw steroids. And then you can... Uh, beyond 6 to 12 months, minimize the targets of tacrolimus. You can be well below 5. You can, you know, target 3 to 5. Long, long term, you could target 1.5 to 3. Uh, I would keep them on MMF, MPAs, because those are tend to be the more neutral agents. 
And so these are the only group of patients that you can minimize immunosuppression quite safely without running the risk of, uh, of uh, rejection. But I would still use the sort of the core agents uh, of uh, TAC MMF, but you know, clearly uh, the dosage and the target levels can be much lower. Well, maybe we can move to other countries if there is questions for Dr. Flavio Vincenti. For me, that's a bit fine. Okay. From Damascus too. Uh, thank you. My question about uh, mental therapy, if, have, uh, if I have the uh, patient uh, two months post-transplant, uh, not on target level of TAC despite maximum dose, and have a uh, high butinuria, about uh, two grams. So I cannot change from CNI to Amtura. If there is benefit, if yeah. there is benefit, if there is benefit to change from tacolimus to cyclus borin to reach the target level or not? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, patients who have proteinuria have, or uh, first of all, when, when you deal with proteinuria, be careful, make sure that the proteinuria is from the new kidney and not the old kidneys. Because some people will have some glomerular disease and may still make urine, and whatever proteinuria you see, it's coming from the old kidney. So if the proteinuria post-transplant is about two grams, but the patient had some proteinuria pre-transplant, and this is probably coming from the old kidneys, you can still put them on mTOR. The problem with mTOR is that if, you, if the transplanted kidney has proteinuria, it means the podocyte uh, cytoskeleton is already abnormal. And we know that the mTOR uh, do disrupt the cytoskeleton of the podocyte, and they're more likely to induce abnormalities and aggravate the proteinuria. So at some point, you may the patients may develop focal sclerosis that will progress. And that's why it's not a good reason to, uh, it's, one has to be careful. Uh, at our center, uh, we allow up to half a gram of proteinuria. Ideally, it should be, you know, a protein creatine ratio of 0.2. But we allow up to half a gram. Uh, if the patient has over a gram or two grams, uh, then we prefer to rely more on the CNI and not use mTORs. Uh, second question, if there is a relationship between high dose of TAC and ischemic cerebrovascular attack? Uh, well, you know, uh, the the urine inhibitors are vasoconstrictive and, and therefore you know, they can be as associated with ischemic attacks. Now, uh, tacrolimus has less phase of constriction than cyclosporin. Uh, uh, however, high TAC levels can induce, uh, you know, ischemic attacks or can produce ischemia. And so uh, I think in general, uh, you know, at the beginning after transplant, you need high target of tacrolimus. But beyond six months, when rejection rates are very low, I mean, most rejection occur in the first three to six months, one can reduce uh, the target levels of tacrolimus quite a bit uh, without undermining immunosuppression, uh, but avoiding at the same time toxicities. Okay. Is it okay? Uh, just uh, wanted to know your comment about a recent but very important study published like three months ago in uh, NDT journal about uh, uh, prospective randomized uh, multicenter study in Germany involving uh, around 500 transplant patients where the initiation of Evrolimus at three, three months post-transplantation uh, with uh, complete withdrawal of CNI, which was, I think, uh, cyclosporin, has resulted in uh, a better GFR with a few ML, but more importantly, with uh, equal uh, uh, acute rejection rate. What would you, uh, you comment on this? And please, I have another question regarding CNI toxicity. CNI toxicity, nowadays, we, we, we hear uh, less news about it. Uh, in, in, the, in the past 10 years, we used to know that the 10 years, uh, the 10 years outcome of uh, patients on cyclosporin 
100% of them, they develop uh, some, somehow cyclosporine toxicity. Nowadays, we are talking more about chronic rejection and chronic antibody-mediated rejection. So the question is, we know, is there any overlap? Is there, uh, the, the issue is over immunosuppression or under immunosuppression because the approach will be completely different. What would you comment on this? Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, uh, let me answer the second question because that's a, a super important question. Uh, as you said, many years ago, because of the paper of, uh, from Australia uh, uh, that showed that 100% evidence of nephrotoxicity over 10 years, patients who had repeated biopsies. And so the conclusion from that, CNI is bad, everybody develops nephrotoxicity, reduce it. Uh, now, and now the, what happened, the pendulum shifted to the other side with a study by Phil Halloran and another study called the DECAF trial, when, when they examined carefully patients who had lost their kidney or who had a rising creatinine, and of course using the new technologies of looking for donor-specific antibodies and C4D, what they found that the majority of patients, about 60%, uh, lost their graft or, uh, or uh, had deterioration in the renal function was due to the presence of antibody-mediated rejection, either because the presence of DSA or because the presence of C4D in the kidney. Uh, and in fact, in one of the studies, the one that I mentioned by Phil Halloran, uh, when they looked at all the causes of graft failure in, the tra in transplant recipients, none of them they ascribed to CNI nephrotoxicity. And you know how pendulums go? They go to one extreme and then they swing to the other extreme. Uh, 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 there is a very recent article, which is an EPUB in AGT, and it's a beautiful article by the Mayo Group, where they, they studied 700 patients that they biopsied over 10 years. And at 10 years, in fact, what they found that most patients had vascular disease, glomerular disease, and only 12% had evidence of transplant glomerulopathy. Again, suggesting, frankly, that, uh, uh, th that basically we need to have a more moderate view of both. CNI are still nephrotoxic, but they are not the main cause of graft loss that was suggested by the paper of uh, uh, Jeremy Chapman in the England Journal many years ago. On the other hand, saying everything is due to chronic antibody-mediated rejection is an overcall. However, maintaining good immunosuppression appears to be important. You have to remember that many of these studies, there was a very high incidence of non-adherence, non-compliance with drug. So if you have patients who are comply with drugs, I think the rate of chronic antibody mediated rejection is, is much lower. And so I think uh, we need to sort of uh, think a bit differently and not go to one extreme or the other to say everything is due to antibodies and uh, uh, allogeneic uh, uh, responses or that all patients or all kidneys are lost from CNI nephrotoxicity. The truth is that both of them are important. Maybe I would put more emphasis on alloimmune responses than CNI nephrotoxicity. But I believe that CNI nephrotoxicity uh, uh, plays a role. So sorry, remind me again the, f the first part of your question and I'll answer it again. What was the first part of your question? Yeah, the conversion from CNI yeah, based yes, about the study. Uh, okay, now, uh, you know, I, I think the, the mTOR I uh, inhibitors got a bad rap uh, because when, uh, Serolimus was introduced, it was not introduced well, the studies were not very good. And I think now there is a reappraisal of the mTOR. Uh, the, 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 let me tell you the problem with the mTOR, they're gay drugs. I mean, you know, if you give mTOR inhibitors to worms, they live longer. They give it to mice, they live longer. Uh, it's important in longevity. It's important in so many important processes in the body. The, the problem with mTOR inhibitors is that at any point when you use it, about maybe 25% of patients, at the very least, I would say, do not tolerate it. 
they either get uh, uh, mouth sores or they get some edema or they just don't feel good. So uh, that is an issue. Uh, those patients who tolerate it, uh, the, the one problem possibly is that you have to make sure the patient does not have underlying rejection or previous history of rejection because on mTOR only, there seem at least one study from Germany suggested a higher rate of DSA. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think if you, I don't know that I would go wholesale and convert everybody, but I think every time there is a good reason for conversion, uh, the, it may make sense to convert them to mTOR inhibitors. And, you know, we have to see the uh, findings of the TRANSFORM trial. This is the largest kidney transplant trial ever done with immunosuppression that uh, utilizes mTOR, but with a very low dose of tacrolimus. And maybe that will be from day zero. And so that may be another way of uh, using mTOR inhibitors. Okay, uh, from Baghdad, we have uh, two questions. Uh, Dr. Hassan Al Amri, first. Uh, thank you, sir, for this nice lecture. I want to ask you about the, uh, if the patient has uh, renal transplantation and high risk of recurrent focal segmental globulin. Oh, I, sorry, your voice faded. I did not hear the question. Uh, if the patient has renal transplantation and have high risk of uh, recurrent focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. Yeah. Your, op your opinion about the steroid minimization in these patients, because I saw a lot of patients, uh, once decrease the dose of steroid or stopping steroid, have significant proteinuria. And uh, the, the next question, if there is your opinion about uh, CNI minimization and mTOR inhibitor in this patient, suppose he still have low, uh, low uh, non-significant proteinuria. Okay, well, you know, I could give you a whole hour on FSGS because this is my area of interest. Uh, FSSG patients, I would not stop steroids. I would be, keep them on high levels of CNI. So now we understand how steroids and CNI work in, in FSGS. And they, their effect is not as immunosuppressive agents, but in fact, their direct effect on the cytoskeleton. Uh, so they should remain on steroids these patients, ideally, I would target higher dose of CNI, uh, and I would not use uh, absolutely mTOR inhibitors because the main problem with patients with FSGS is that they have abnormalities that lead to uh, uh, basically destabilization of the cytoskeleton uh, of the podocyte. And so that would be, a, for me, a contraindication to use mTOR inhibitors. Thank you. Second question from Dr. Riyadh Yes. Thank you, sir. I am just asking about which is from your practice is preferable of the mTOR inhibitor for those patients with post transplant lymphoproliferative disorders, the Evrolimus or the Sevrolimus. My second question is that should I reduce and minimize the dose of the mTOR? for those with post transplant uh, lymphopoliferative disease as a part of general minimization of the immune suppression? Oh, very good questions. Um, you know, frankly, uh, there isn't head to head to compare Everolimus versus Serolimus. I can tell you what our practice is at UCSF. We have shifted using the Everolimus because it has a shorter half-life and we have felt that maybe uh, there are less side effects with Everolimus. Uh, but if, again, this is one's perception and this is not based on outcome studies. Uh, that's one. Uh, if, uh, I think in terms of cancers and PTLD, uh, the benefit, beneficial effect of the NTOR may override their immunosuppressive effect. So I would not use very low levels. I mean, of course, uh, mTOR levels have to be somewhere between like five to seven or five to eight in these patients. And so, or four to eight. Uh, so that would be the range. But I would certainly not lower it very much 
because I'm afraid of the immunosuppression, I think their anti-tumor effect supersedes their immunosuppressive effects. The next question from Dr. Alai Sheikh. Thank you, Professor Vincenti. I would like to uh, ask about patient with the chronic graft dysfunction. Uh, what are the factors that uh, may, apart from the um, proteinuria and the GFR below 40, that make you more uh, uh, able to go for uh, mTOR inhibitor? And if there is uh, histological evidences, apart from interstitial fibrosis and the IFTA, do you look for other things in the, in the biopsy to, to have your opinion to go for mTOR or CNI minimization? Thank you. Well, yeah, that's, that's a, a, an important question. You know, I think, first of all, if there is IFTA with inflammation, I always get concerned about converting away from CNI. Uh, if it's only IFTA and quiescence, uh, then I may more likely uh, uh, consider conversion. The other issue, and this is uh, a matter of some controversy, whether you see arterial hyalinosis. I mean, we used to think of that as always related to CNI nephrotoxicity, but that may not be the case. But if you do have vascular changes and especially arterial hyalinosis, uh, you can either consider uh, converting to uh, mTOR inhibitors or minimizing CNI. I think these are the areas that I would uh, basically considered to be other important histological markers. The last question from Dr. Mustafa Rasul. Thank you, sir, for your nice uh, lecture. I want you to ask you just in this uh, two points. The first point in a patient with post-transplant avascular necrosis. Uh, did you think uh, we have to stop or uh, just minimize the steroid dose? The second question is that in a patient with a proteinuria after renal transplantation, uh, how much we, we have to, to, to see the uh, an increase in his uh, protein urea to uh, say that it is from the graft, not from the native kidneys? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, yeah, that, uh, it's always hard. I, I tell you what, in all our patients who have glomerular diseases or who, are, who still have functioning kidneys, they're not on dialysis and still make urine. We always like to take a urine protein creatinine sample before the transplant so that we get an idea of how much proteinuria comes from the native kidneys. And so, uh, you know, I, I, you know I, I think if the protein goes up by 50 to 100% from the baseline, one has to become a tiny bit uh, concerned about uh, the, uh, the, the proteinuria. But, you know, if you have people with membranous or somebody with focal, uh, if they have, if they are up to three grams of protein, we don't do anything. But if they have like five or 10 grams of proteinuria from the native kidneys, sometimes we take out their kidneys at the time of transplant because then otherwise there is no way. I mean, it's easy if somebody has 500 milligrams, 700 milligram protein and it goes to two grams, then you can say, well, this is coming from the new kidney. But if you have a patient who has seven grams proteinuria or eight grams, it's going to be very difficult to know what is from the old and what's new. So I, I, I would encourage you to get a baseline protein uh, creatine ratio. What was your other question uh, that you had? Yes, please. About the steroid. Oh, in patient with uh, avascular. Yeah, I mean, I think if somebody has avascular necrosis, you should consider seriously stopping or lowering steroids, maybe every other day or, or lowering it further. Uh, because don't forget, if they have it in one joint, they may get it in the other joints. If they have one hip, they may get it in the other hip or in the knee. And it means their skeleton is susceptible. And so I, I, I definitely would, yes. Thank you. So uh, if there are no more questions, let's move to the second topic. Uh, I'm going to be discussing the ray graph function and the diagnostic and some novel approaches, something that, uh, you know, you may have in your hands in, in the near future. Uh, and, you know, ischemia reperfusion 
uh, it's not only for delay graft function in kidney transplant, it's also for us nephrologists, cardiac surgery, uh, or patients who get contrast or, and sepsis. So there is uh, a common, uh, most likely a common mechanism of uh, injury that uh, in all these uh, disease entities. Uh, it, it has been difficult to get a drug approved for DGF uh, because the FDA does not consider an agent that just prevent an increase in serum creatinine sufficient for registration. They like to see a change in clinical outcome. In other words, do you prevent dialysis? Uh, is the kidney function ultimately better? Uh, do you decrease rejection rates? Now, uh, there are a lot of uh, agents now in clinical trials. I'm going to talk only about some because those are actively in trial and they stand the chance of, of uh, being positive. This is a, a drug from Quark. Uh, I think they're collaborating with Novartis. It says a small interfering uh, uh, RNA and I'll discuss it. Uh, second drug is Eculizumab from Alexion. Uh, although it failed, I'm going to discuss it just because uh, complement inhibition appears to be important for delay graph function. This is a study using an anti-TNF. This is a study which is still ongoing. It's pegulated carbon monoxide delivery, basically, uh, to patients. And this is a, uh, uh, a possibly the most interesting agent, if it works. It's called a BB3 uh, hepatic growth factor. And this is the only agent not to be given to prevent DGF, but you give it when the patient has DGF to have quicker recovery of renal function. So what is the definition and the incidence of DGF? This is again from the UNOS registry data. We expect in living recipients of living donor to have very low rate of, FH, of uh, DGF, 4%. In standard criteria kidneys, the good kidneys, it should be around 28%. Higher in extended criteria donors, uh, higher in patients uh, in, uh, in recipient of uh, kidneys from donation after cardiac deaths. And then of course the highest when you have a combination of uh, uh, kidneys that come uh, from donors after cardiac deaths, and they are also ECD, about 50%. Uh, uh, so the best definition of DGF is that uh, the patient needs dialysis in the first week after transplant, and the dialysis is not um, done, performed for hyperkalemia. Slow graph function, some people consider it uh, also a risk factor. This is when the creatine by day five is over 2.5. And, uh, and some, it's felt in some uh, studies that as, a slow graph function has similar risks, but lower than delay graph function. So how do we define the risk? And there are two scoring uh, uh, system out there that have been used. One of them is actually, it's called the, uh, the Novartis score uh, by a paper by these investigator, a prospective validation scoring index to predict the leg graph function. And this was again, based on the UNOS uh, data and was used to select patient for a study uh, based on the scoring system. So this scoring system uses donor age and it gives for, let's say, the best kidneys, the, the young one uh, under 40, zero, and then the older one, the oldest, a score of six. Prior transplant, either no, yes, zero, two, whether the recipient is uh, African-American black or not black. Cold ischemia time, the longer cold ischemia time, the bigger the score they give you. And if the donor death was due to CVA, if it's, if it's uh, over age 50 and due to this CVA, you, uh, you assign a score of three. So you add all the scores. If the patient has a below a score of three, the risk of DGF is very low. Between three and six is 60%, and between 13 to 18, the risk may be as high as 100%. There is a new scoring system that is increasingly used. If, in fact, this is called the Irish 
scoring system for predicting DGF, and this is used in almost all the new studies with drugs for DGF. This is a more extensive uh, scoring system. It gives points according to the HLA match, donor age, uh, donor creatinine, the last donor creatinine, the peak PRA, and for the cold ischemia time, it gives one point for each hour of cold ischemia. So a patient who has five hours of cold ischemia would get five points. Somebody with 30 hours of cold ischemia would get 30 points. If, they, if the recipient is black, you get um, so many points. If, they, if the patient get a single organ transplant, so just like kidney, not a kidney, liver, etc., cetera, uh, and they had been on previous dialysis, they get 40 points. If they have neither, they get 20 points. Non heart beating donors, so uh, donation after cardiac death, they get 29 points and what have you. So you add all the points here, uh, and then and then you you measure the risk of DGF. So uh, patients who have let's say less points have a low risk of DGF. Beyond that, as you can see, the more the points, the higher the risk of DGF. So basically, if you have like close to 200 points, your risk of DGF is, is 80%. And as I said, this is now uh, frequently utilized, it's called the Irish score, uh, for selecting patients at high risk for DGF for clinical uh, trials. Uh, now, this is a nice study where uh, uh, on clinical basis and usual clinic and data that you obtain, can you predict day one or two whether the patient's going to have a uh, uh, DGF. And, the, and these investigators uh, collected blood and the urine to measure creatinine from living donors who had immediate graft function, and then applied it to uh, patients who received deceased donors with either immediate graft function, slow graft function, and severe DGF. And what the criteria that they use was the following. If the urine creatinine day two is greater than 1,000 milligrams, and the creatinine reduction between day one and day two, this is the serum creatinine reduction, is greater than 30%, these patients tend to have immediate graft function. If the creatinine, uh, urine creatinine, 24 urine creatinine on day two is, it, is more than 1,000 milligrams, but the creatinine reduction rate is less than 30%, and I'll show you what that means. They have mild DGF. And those who have severe DGF and tend to require dialysis have, of, in the second day, a creatinine excretion of less than 8,000 and a creatinine reduction index below 30%. So here are the number. So this, these are patients who had immediate function. First day, creatinine 6, 7. Second day, dropped to 3.3, reduction 50%. And the urine creatinine day two was 2,627 milligrams. The mild one had a very small uh, reduction of uh, the creatinine, only 7%, uh, but they had excretion of 1,468 milligrams. And the severe DGF had no reduction whatsoever. So 9.6 first day, it went up to 10.1. So it's actually a negative 18. And they had less than a thousand milligrams of uh, of creatinine. So by day two, if you use these formulas, you can categorize a patient whether they're going to have excellent function early on, slow function, or uh, uh, or uh, delayed function, most likely requiring dialysis. Now, what the endpoints for uh, DGF trials? Basically, the classic one is whether the patient needs dialysis the day on the initiation and the duration. So these are the most important. Also, of course, there is a question of measuring urine volume, change in creatinine, GFR, slopes. But frankly, the dialysis parameter is the most important. And of course, we are trying to develop biomarkers that tells us whether the patient is likely or not likely to have delay graph function. So, Okay, the delay graph function may be more costly and a hassle and you have to dialyze the patient, but is there a long-term impact? Meaning, is there more graft loss? Is there more rejection if patients have delay graph function? 
This is one of the earlier meta-analysis of all the studies that uh, compared patient with DGF without DGF. And in this study, at least, they showed that, uh, again, anything over one means greater uh, risk, that the risk of graft loss was higher in patients who had DGF in most of the studies. And when they also assess the risk of rejection, they, uh, the rejection rates, the risk of rejection, uh, the hazard ratios were over one. Uh, the problem with this first large meta-analysis that some of the studies went back to 1988 and early 1990s before we had all the new drugs for uh, better immunosuppression. So uh, there is a new, oh, so there is a new analysis, okay? Uh, and uh, this is a, a much better analysis that gives you more insight or more granularity into, into the process. So this used uh, the uh, UNOS database. And what they did, they said, let's look at donors whereby one kidney developed DGF and the other kidney did not. This way you remove the variable of the donor. So they looked at 54,000 donors, uh, 15,000, only one kidney was transplanted, 27,000 donors. Both kidneys either had DGF or did not have DGF. However, 9,000, one kidney went into a recipient that had DGF and the other kidney it worked. So one could compare the outcome of the kidneys. Uh, so uh, in general, uh, those who had longer cold ischemia time had more DGF, the kidneys had more DGF than the comparable kidney that had the lower ischemia time. And as you can see, the more the ischemia time, the longer, the more DGF occurred. So the clearly a relationship between cold ischemia time and DGF. Now, in terms of graft loss, and when we have to look at death sensor graft loss, uh, the cold ischemia time and the risk of DGF did not change the uh, risk for uh, graft loss. So in this study, and I think this is, you know, the, the most rigid study and it's a very nice study, uh, having a delay graft function did not affect uh, graft outcome. Now, if you look at patient death, in fact, the higher cold ischemia time, uh, the higher risk, 27% increased risk of patient death. The problem here was that um, the patients in this group here with long cold ischemia time tended to be the sicker patients and the authors did not feel that they, uh, 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 the analysis took in consideration the high risk. So their, their conclusion was that the delay graph function and cold ischemia time does not affect graft uh, outcome. Now studies uh, for delay graph function have been difficult to do because especially if you want to intervene with the cadaver donor, because when they, the, the question when the donor is a cadaver, uh, is, it, is, is that patient, is that donor a patient? Do you get need consent from the family? Do you need to consent the hospital? Do all the recipients who get the kidney have to be consented that they got kidneys from a uh, donor that underwent uh, some form of experimental procedure. So that has been quite a difficult uh, 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 approach to uh, treat uh, cadaver donors. So let me talk about the first uh, carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide, while in high doses is of course is toxic and, uh, and can of course uh, result in death, However, it's an endogenous produced as a byproduct of the heme metabolism. And carbon monoxide has very potent cytoprotective uh, anti-inflammatory uh, properties. It has anti-apoptosis, so it does not allow the cells to undergo apoptosis and anti-proliferative effect in endothelial, epithelial, and smooth muscle cells and other cell type. And there are quite a few experimental uh, uh, basis for carbon monoxide uh, as a beneficial uh, agent to uh, mitigate the effect of ischemia reperfusion. And I'm going to show you a couple of studies. This study was done in pig allotransplant 
60 minutes of warm ischemia, 24 hours of cold ischemia, and then uh, the carbon monoxide was delivered through a ventilator for one hour. And tacrolimus was used as immunosuppression. So here, the, the animals that got carbon monoxide did not have a rise in creatinine, very mild, had a smaller rise in BUN as compared to the control. And the carboxyhemoglobin bit, uh, did not, was at 10% at its highest, lower than the 15%, which is uh, presumably the danger point. And again, in the, uh, these are the control animals untreated. In the middle, those who are given just air and have a lot of tubular necrosis and the tunnel stain for apoptosis shows a lot of positive tunnel cells. However, those animals that got carbon monoxide had a very nice histology and no tunnel cells. So it protected the kidney from ischemia reperfusion injury. And this is what they call the heat map. These are the control animals. These received only air and these received carbon monoxide. And you can see those who, the animals that had only air and had ischemia reperfusion had a lot of upregulation of genes of inflammation, which were not upregulated with carbon monoxide. And this is just to show you that Proteins that are important in, uh, as anti-inflammatory and healing like osteopontin, uh, heat shock protein 90 and the retinal binding protein 4 were all higher uh, with, uh, with carbon monoxide treated animals and the, uh, 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 the MCP, which is an inflammatory cytokines was significantly lower in, patients, in animals treated with carbon monoxide as control. So uh, one study was performed in, in humans, uh, giving them at the time of anesthesia, bubbling uh, through the ventilator of carbon monoxide. However, the FDA then stopped the trial because they were concerned that these, the patients may have had too high levels of uh, carboxyhemoglobin. Now, another trial is being done whereby carbon monoxide, instead of being given through the ventilator, is infused through a pegylated process called sanguinate. So this sanguinate delivers uh, carbon monoxide over a period of few hours, and it's given at the time of transplantation. The study is ongoing, and we'll see whether we can reproduce in humans what we saw in pigs. This is a second study uh, with the different molecules, and this is called QPI1002. This is a small interfering RNA uh, that targets P53. So it targets the um, um, messenger RNA of P53. And P53 is a stress response genes. It triggers cellular pathways that induce cell cycle errors, senescence, and apoptosis. So if we block P53, we block uh, the, the rapid apoptosis of ischemic cells. And this inhibition is temporary. Uh, and the, when infused into, uh, into animals, uh, QPI002 accumulates very quickly in the proximal tubular cells. And these are the cells that we see in ATN with ischemia reperfusion injury. This is a model of a warm ischemia in, in, uh, in mice. Uh, there is bilateral clamping of the pedicle for 30 to 45 minutes. You allow reperfusion and look at the, uh, at the ischemia reperfusion. So uh, these animals were infused with the, this drug QP100. This is before infusion. Within minutes of the infusion, uh, the drug, which is in red here, you can see it in the capillaries. Then you see it in Bowman's capsule. So it's filtered and this is in the tubules. Then it's picked up by the tubular, loop, by the tubular uh, cells. And here you can see now the tubular cells are all red because they, uh, this silencing RNA is, uh, has a red color to it or a, a fluorescence, red fluorescence. And it stays around for about uh, less than 24 hours. By 24 hours, it's all gone. And so uh, we know that, uh, uh, oh, let me see. Uh, again, so in these uh, uh, animals, this is a control. These are the, uh, con the animals that were developed AKI. 
And these are the ones that were treated with the siRNA p53. And you can see both the PBS, the buffered saline, and the negative uh, control have a high creatinine. Those animals treated with the p53 uh, silencing RNA inhibitor had a much lower creatinine. Uh, what's interesting, again, is that uh, if you give the drug uh, I, either two hours before or six hours before, or even four hours after the ischemia, you get the best results. So you don't have to give it before, you can give it up to four hours after the ischemia. Beyond four hours, as you can see, then the effect, it's lost. So either you have to give it before or it seems to work best after four hours after the ischemic episode. And here, increasing the dose does increase the effect of the protective effect. As you can see, the control had high creatinines, and those treated with a silencing RNA had a much lower rise in creatinine. Uh, and this is another uh, ischemic model. This is both warm and cold ischemia in the, in the rat. And uh, you can see that uh, those that are given the drug uh, at 24 hours had significant reduction of the uh, creatinine. And the best results are in this group here which got one dose 15 minutes before and the second dose four hours afterwards. So uh, a study was performed uh, in humans. This is a phase two trial treatment with QPI1002, a short interfering uh, RNA for prophylaxis of delayed graft function. So the patients were uh, selected at a high risk for delayed graft function and were treated pre-transplant. Uh, the patients were allocated to either be ECD or SCD, and either have a cold stored or machine perfused. There are some centers in the States that use a machine perfusion in, instead of cold storage. Anyway, uh, they projected from the patients selected that there would be 30 to 36, 35 to 36% risk of DGF. In fact, turn out to be around 30%. However, uh, uh, as a whole, there wasn't a difference between the patients receiving the drug and placebo. However, patients who got a kidney from ECD donors who were cold stored had lower uh, uh, DGF than those who did not on the placebo. 27% who received the drug versus 39%. Also, they had lower number of uh, dialysis, 13 days versus 25, uh, uh, and mean number of dialysis, six versus 11. And the one difference which was significant is that at day 30, those who received the drug had the GFR of 37, those who received placebo had the GFR of 21. Again, the only positive findings were in patients who got ECD kidneys, who also had uh, cold storage. The, in the other patients, it did not make a difference. So in this phase two analysis, the patients who uh, best uh, had the most favorable results are those who received ECD kidneys. So now there is a bigger trial, uh, a phase three trial in, for DGF using this drug. And this trial now, it's actually designed pretty similarly uh, except now uh, uh, the patients are stratified between age 45 and 45, 59 or greater than uh, 60. And uh, the fa this phase three is enrolling probably within a year, we should have the results and see whether the silencing RNA works as well in humans as in their, in their rats. Now, another interesting approach is to inhibit complement. And complement has been shown to play a role in delay graph function. Uh, and I just want to show you uh, just of all the studies, one, the most interesting study. So in this study, uh, and this is also to show that the complement system that is important, that plays a role in the pathway of injury in ischemia reperfusion is not the circulating complement, but it's a complement within the kidney. So. Uh, these are uh, 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 rodents, uh, mouse, that got, a ki that got kidneys that uh, were made ischemic. 
the higher figure here, the straight line, these are uh, kidneys from wild type uh, mice transplanted in wild type animals after bilateral nephrectomy. And so uh, uh, this kidney that had uh, uh, ischemia uh, developed very high creatinine and gradually got better. The second kidney that did not develop much rise in creatinine was from a C3 deficient uh, mouse. So this mouse was deficient in the kidney of C3. Although it was put in a wild type mouse that had normal circulating complement, the, the injury was much muted and the creatinine was very little. So again, suggesting that uh, the complement within the kidney plays a role and in fact, the histology, the, the wild type kidney and the wild type mice showed a lot of injury, while the kidney from the three deficient, the C3 deficient uh, mouse that had no complement in the wild type mouse showed a normal uh, kidney. The prob so uh, Alexion used eculizumab, which is an anti-C5 antibody blocking complement to to see whether it would help in delay graph function, and the study failed. So this was a big surprise because really there is a lot of evidence about um, complement. So at this point, it's not clear what will happen next. Uh, also important uh, with delay graph function is that in many studies, there are a lot of inflammatory cytokines infiltrating the kidney uh, after ischemia. And therefore, this is a study by the NIH whereby patients are randomized to receive one dose of infliximab. And infliximab is an anti-TNF, and the hope is that by blocking TNF, we can block inflammation and we can decrease uh, DGF. We are participating in the study. It has enrolled like 100 out of 300 patients, and it's gonna be a bit of time. And now the very best news, I left it for the end. This is a study published in New England Journal by our by my associates. Klaus Niemann is one uh, uh, part of the uh, anesthesia team at UCSF. Um, Dr. Roberts is head of the service. Dr. Hiroshi is one of the other surgeons. This is a multicenter trial. This trial was to do therapeutic hypothermia and disease organ donors and to look at kidney graft function and DGF. So what these investigators did they lowered the temperature of the deceased donor by two degrees centigrade only. And then they randomized donors to either be kept at the normal temperature, room temperature, or to lower their temperature by two degrees. And what happened? Well, overall, uh, there was a, a significant decrease here at the very bottom. The risk of DGF, there was a significant decrease in the risk of DGF by 30%. It was much more obvious in patients who were e in ECD recipients. It was a tiny bit less obvious. It didn't reach statistical significance in standard criteria donor. I believe that uh, the DSMB stopped the study because of this very dramatic effect. But I believe if we had continued accruing patients, we would have seen benefits in both ex extended criteria and standard criteria donors. So why is this so magnificent? Because this is the only procedure that costs nothing, no money. All you have to do is decrease the temperature of the deceased donor by two degrees centigrade, while all these other drugs are gonna be very expensive. And basically the effect of hypothermia is similar to the very drugs that I have been discussed. The few drugs that have been shown to have favorable effect have the same percentage effect. So if this works, and it does work, I think this would be the, uh, one of the better approaches to reduce DGF. So in conclusion, in conclusion, ischemia reperfusion injury remains a challenging entity in both native kidneys and renal transplantation. Several agents are currently in clinical trial for DGF. Whether any of these agents will prove superior to simple hypothermia of the deceased organ donor remains to be determined. Thank you for your attention and certainly happy to answer any questions that you may have. I would like to remind you though, before we come to the question,
that this CME activity is being brought to you today again by AKH and Kikako American International and is supported by an educational grant by of artists and also that uh, you can log in and uh, uh, and you have the information uh, to the website to get your uh, CME credits and so uh, uh, I'd be happy to answer your questions Are we ready for questions? Hello? Can you hear me? Can I? Yes, from Damascus, one question, please. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, you did mention in one of your slides about the incidence of uh, DGF uh, in uh, living donor transplant, which was uh, only 4%, which is very good, of course, and we understand very good why. But unfortunately, quite often we notice that even with uh, straightforward surgery and from living donor, the incidence of uh, 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 DGF is sometimes is much higher, maybe 10 or 15 percent. I don't know. I wonder in this uh, condition, where is the problem? Is it, for example, uh, related to the use of CNI, which is known to have this uh, vasoconstrictive uh, characteristics if we use it uh, the day before or the night before transplantation does it matter or not and also the question of the hydration status of the transplant patient also uh, the day before trans transplant if we do dialysis or if we do over dialysis is it better to to keep dialysis for two days before transplant or not to use CNI the day before or the night before in order to uh, optimize the condition not to develop DGF for these patients yeah, very good question. Uh, I, uh, uh, well, I think it's multifactorial. Frequently, it could be related to warm ischemia uh, when the surgeon is trying to hook up the artery and the vein and it may stay longer and so on. It may take longer than 30 minutes or so. Uh, but I, I, my suggestion is one, not to use CNI the night before the transplant, to wait until after transplant and start CNI. Uh, number two, uh, when we dialyze patients before the transplant, because we have to dialyze them, either the BUN is very high or the potassium is high, we tend not to take fluid off. And so you, uh, the state of hydration, I think it's important, you're right. I think CNI may play a role, and I don't think we never use CNI before the transplant. We always started the day after the transplant. And so, uh, uh, and you know, sometimes technically it, it's a more complex surgery. It takes longer, warm ischemia time. That could be related. But uh, again, uh, I think uh, taking care of these other maneuvers uh, may reduce your DHGF rate in living donors to around, you know, what's accepted, around 5%. Uh, thank you. This is from Baghdad. Sir, please. Yes. You can hear me. Dr. Mohammed Maqadar has a question, yes. please. Uh, thank you, doctor, for this comprehensive talk. I want to ask about the clinical efficacy of remote ischemic conditioning to delay graft function, uh, as there are many uh, articles or research about it. What about the clinical efficacy and your experience? I, I yeah, I, you know, that's a, a very interesting. I mean, it's all has remained in the experimental phase. And so nothing has come uh, to fruition in terms of, uh, you know, clinical result, frankly. So I, I think experimentally it's kind of appealing, but I don't know that it's going to have practical implementation. Um, well, if we don't have any, any more questions, I'd like to thank you all for participating in this uh, program today. On behalf of Dr. Segev and myself, we would like to thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed uh, the program and you find it uh, uh, both intellectually useful and practical for, uh, uh, for your um, practice. And uh, hopefully we'll have another of these uh, sessions in the future. Thank you all and uh, thank you.
Have a nice evening and uh, a great dinner. Sorry, we cannot join you for dinner. It would have been lovely. <laughs> I would have enjoyed it. For sure. Yeah, we wish we wish you can join. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Vincenti. <laughs>